uh, and welcome, uh, even, even at this stage, <laughs> good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everybody in the room, as I normally do at this point, to switch off mobile phones, um, uh, as they can often interfere with the sound system. Although you will see uh, some of the members and, and the Dave, and Dave the Clarks using tablet uh, devices instead of their hard copies of papers. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation, and we have uh, one affirmative instrument before us. Um, uh, as usual with affirmative affirmative instruments, we'll have an evidence-taking evidence session uh, with um, uh, the Minister uh, and officials uh, on the instrument, and once we have had all of our questions answered, uh, we will have a formal de debate, if necessary, on, uh, uh, on that. Um, the instrument that we're looking at today is Mental Health Detention Conditions Excessive Security Scotland Regulations 2015 draft, and you have that before you. Uh, can I now welcome the Minister for Sport, Health, Improvement and, uh, and, and Mental Health and his officials. Uh, Jamie Hepburn, um, welcome uh, and good morning. Nicola Patterson, uh, Unit Head, Protection of Rights, Unit Mental Health and Protection of the Rights Division. And we have uh, Stephanie Virgo. Virgo. Who, who was, who, who was uh, a late witness just to get me tongue-tied this morning, but welcome, special welcome to you. Um, uh, can we have a brief opening statement from the Minister? I think he's prepared for that. Yes, uh, can thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you for uh, that opportunity to introduce these uh, draft regulations to be made under Section 271A of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. The, Draft regulations before you will deliver this Government's stated intention to ensure that the scheme provided for in the 2003 Act it can operate effectively in the present secure estate. They will fully deliver the recommendation of the Milan report that patients should have a right of appeal to be transferred from the state hospital or a medium secure facility to conditions of lower security by extending the right that is already in force for patients in the state hospital to patients in the three medium secure units in Scotland. Uh, the Government's stated intention was set out in, in an initial uh, draft regulation provided to, to the Committee on the 24th of April to assist uh, your considerations of uh, the provisions in the Mental Health Scotland Bill 2015, which is now of course an Act of uh, Parliament having received royal assent on the 4th of August, Convener. Uh, the draft regulations being considered today uh, differ from those provided in April in only two uh, respects, and I shall deal with each regulation separately and highlight where there has been uh, an amendment. Uh, the 2003 Act introduced a, a requirement for applications to the Mental Health Tribunal from patients in the state hostel and those in medium security to be accompanied by a supportive report prepared by a medical practitioner. Uh, regulation 3 is in addition to the uh, April draft uh, regulation uh, amending the 2003 Act so that the med this medical uh, practitioner must be an approved medical practitioner as defined in section 22.4 of the 2003 Act, uh, as approved medical practitioners have been approved by an NHS board or by the State Hospitals uh, Board for Scotland as having special experience in the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorder, they have the necessary expertise to assess and determine whether a patient requires to be detained under conditions of special security in the State Hospital or whether the uh, test in these regulations is met for patients in qualifying hospitals. Uh, regulation 4 remains unchanged unless the three medium secure units in Scotland and it's the uh, patients in these qualified hostels that will benefit from these regulations through the extension of the right of appeal against being detained in conditions of excessive security. Uh, regulations 5 and 6 set out the test that must be met for the Mental Health Tribunal to grant an order declaring that the patient is being held in conditions of excessive security and requiring the relevant health board to identify a suitable hostel with the appropriate level of security. The test focuses on the key issue of the risks that the patient may pose to themselves and to others. After all, the purpose of security and psychiatric care is to provide a safe and secure environment for patients, staff and visitors, which facilitates appropriate treatment for patients and appropriately protects the wider community. It is only when the level of security that the patient is subject to is greater than necessary to manage these risks that a lower level of security can be considered. The April draft regulations included reference to the risk to patient safety that other persons may pose. This has been removed 
following consultation which highlighted concerns about patients being detained in conditions of excessive security due to the risks posed by others. And with that, Convener, I'm happy to uh, field any questions the committee may have. Thanks, Minister. Uh, we now move to the questions. Rhoda Grant. Can I ask about um, patients who want to appeal their level of security? Quite often that happens after their level of security has been changed. For instance, if they move to somewhere that there's increased security. One of the problems with that is that if they win that appeal, um, the place that they had previously occupied has been given up to somebody else. So they may win their appeal against increased security, but there's no bed anywhere else for them to go. Um, is there anything in the regulations that keeps that, that bed open to them and gives them a period of time to appeal? Uh, I don't think there's anything in the regulations specifically related to that point. Uh, Ms Grant, I can maybe ask Nicola to uh, confirm that in a second. Of course, uh, the legislation is set out as such that if where anyone is successful in an appeal, they are transferred when a bed becomes uh, available, and that's no different to uh, the approach that's taken just now. I'll just maybe ask Nicola to confirm. I think I'm correct in my... You are correct, yeah. yeah. So are there any plans to change that, given that um, somebody's liberty could be at stake um, because there isn't a bed? They had a bed. That bed has now been given up um, and the level of security was wrong. Uh, I'm always willing to take on board uh, suggestions that uh, we can look to finesse and uh, adapt the, the system we have in place. We have no... Uh, clearly, we've just been through uh, a bill process, uh, a very extensive bill process. The committee was obviously uh, integral to uh, that uh, process and uh, we don't have any plans to reassess it uh, any time soon, but of course we're always willing to keep these things uh, under review. It was something discussed during the bill process and something that I think that was on the record a number of times, that a, a place should be kept open with a, a, a time limit to allow people to appeal, um, should that be the case, so that they wouldn't be held in excessive security. Um, but I would be grateful if you would look at that again. Um, my second question is, why, why is it restricted to key places and rather than any level of security one imagines that anyone being kept under an enhanced level of security should have the right to appeal um, down to having no security at all? Well, essentially, and I set this out in my opening remarks, we're trying to fulfil what the 2003 Act required us to legislate for. Now, it's taken us a long time to get there. I would willingly concede that point, but the, the 2003 Act was pretty clear, and indeed the Milan report was pretty clear that it was uh, to relate a right of appeal against excessive security was related to relate to those held in the state hostel and those in uh, medium uh, security, uh, and that's what we're fulfilling with these regulations. Thanks, Rona. Malcolm Chisholm. Um, well, I mean, I obviously share Rona Grant's concern, but I, I mean, I accept that was all dealt with uh, at stage three. In the chamber, although I, I, I still have a quarrel with you, and of course you, it's not just what you said there, but what you said in your policy note about what the 2003 Act required, because of course there is no mention of medium security in the 2003 Act, and uh, the whole case at the Supreme Court in 2012 that this uh, that has required you to bring these regulations uh, would never have been taken if, uh, if, if medium security had been mentioned in the... 2003 Act, because, of course, the, the man who w went to the Supreme Court w was in low, secure accommodation. So <coughs> I, I think it's not very, you know, I don't think it's accurate to say that you're, you're doing this because of, of what the 2003 Act requires. I mean, you, you've made a policy decision to do this, that you, you only want to have the right of appeal in medium secure. I, I would willingly concede, yes, it's also a policy a decision to take up the point, though, Mr Chisholm, about the uh, the legal challenge, and uh, it's correct to say that it was someone who was held in the circumstances of low uh, security who brought forward the uh, challenge, but uh, the court's ruling uh, did not relate to that fact. The court's ruling was uh, related to the fact that we had failed, uh, as, uh, as a parliament, actually, to institute any form of uh, legislation uh, based on what we had said we would do in 2003, when we passed the 2003 Act, so uh, the fact that uh, the individual was in uh, low security wasn't uh, necessarily relevant to the specific regulations that we sought to, to bring forward. 
I mean, I accept that the judgment didn't uh, didn't um, say anything about low secure. My, my point was that he would never have got to court in the first place if the legislation had talked about medium secure, because the man would have had no grounds for an appeal if he was in low secure and the, and the legislation had described medium secure. So that that was my point around that, and I just think. For me personally, it's very annoying that you keep talking about this in your policy note. Um, and of course, the other thing that rather I'll, I have got a question in a minute, but I'm just uh, specifically about Regulation Three. But the other point, of course, in your policy note, you refer to the Mental Welfare Commission consultation forum, and you say there was some divergence of opinion among participants. While some consultees questioned the need to introduce regulations, the group as a whole recognised <coughs> that this was an option. But of course, you failed to say that the um, the Mental Welfare Commission, the Scottish Association of Mental Health, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the Law Society of Scotland, the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Independence Advocacy Alliance all wanted it to be extended to low secure as well. Yes, but uh, you know that anyway, uh, Mr Chisholm, I suppose I would uh, observe. I mean, the, the point I would uh, make is um, that uh, the Milan uh, report was very clear that it was patients in medium secure facilities should have a right of appeal. We're fulfilling uh, what was set out in uh, that report. For those who are held in uh, low security, I think we should also remember this is about the level of security uh, you're held at, not the specific circumstances uh, around which uh, uh, you, you it might be uh, held, um, detained. Uh, the, uh, there are already uh, means by which those held in low security can um, appeal against certain circumstances of their detention and of course if they are in uh, conditions of less security they can uh, also ultimately appeal the fact that they're being uh, held at all so um, uh, uh, there is already a mechanism there for those who are in the lowest form of secure accommodation. Yeah, well I mean, um, I mean I think the key thing in the Mil Milan was the least restrictive manner and environment compatible with the delivery of safe and effective mm. care I think that was the principle behind uh, the amendments in the 2003 Act. Um, now, my question about Regulation 3, is, I mean, I, I realise it's a minor point, but uh, I always get worried when regulations amend primary legislation, so I'm just a bit worried, not worried, but I'm just really curious as to how this came about. It, was this just omitted from the bill changing to approve medical practitioner at the time, or was that just something that wasn't wasn't caught because presumably is that now the definition in, th in 329 clause 1? I don't think it used to be. It was that? It's a, it's a bit of a tidying up exercise and it was also something that was raised with us by practitioners themselves that it should that should be the definition. Yeah, but, but, but you say in your note that approved medical practitioner as defined in section 3291. So is, is that, was that already in the, in the act from, from the debate in June? I might just bring Nicola in uh, relation to that, but uh, I think actually it's from the 2003 uh, Act rather than the uh, the one that we just uh, passed. But I don't know if you've got anything to, to add in relation to that. Um, an approved medical practitioner is defined in the 2003 Act. Um, so, uh, in, in essence, in uh, introducing that amendment. Um, here we are just using that definition that already exists following discussions with stakeholders. So rather than a more general term of medical practitioner, it's a very specific defined term um, in the 2003 Act of approved medical practitioner. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's a substantive point. I'm, I'm still a bit curious about that because if, if that was the term used in the 2003 Act, you'd think it would have been in the clauses of the 2003 Act. But anyway, I, I accept that's rather a technical point, but it's quite interesting at the same time, because obviously that is an important part of what you're proposing, that appeals are only possible um, with um, the consent of an approved medical practitioner, which again might be quite a restraint, I suppose, on how many people are actually able to exercise that particular appeal. Well, if the uh, first 100 uh, state hospital patients to make an application, 91% of those whose applications were unsuccessful uh, did not have support for the application. So I, I suppose it's, uh, it, we're trying to strike a balance here between uh, ensuring that we don't have uh, speculative appeals that might be encouraged by someone other than the patient, which could be very disruptive uh, for uh, the patient's uh, uh, treatment, but also ultimately giving a patient a right to 
they seek to appeal where they they feel the circumstances are merited and they can get a, an approved medical practitioner to provide uh, evidence to back that up. You accept you are restricting, in that sense, the intention of the 2003 Act? I wouldn't say we're restricting the intention of the 2003 Act. I would say that we are trying to put in place a system that is designed to ensure those individuals who are held in either a state hospital or indeed now the medium secure accommodation have that right of appeal but is taken forward in such a manner that is not likely to be unnecessarily disruptive to the treatment of uh, people who may be in very vulnerable circumstances. Well, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think you should accept that you have modified the intention, which was so profusely praised by the cab current Cabinet Secretary for Health, who thought it was the part of the 2003 Act which she was most enthusiastic about. Well, I know she's very happy with what we're doing here too, Mr I'm Chisholm. Glad, I'm glad to hear it. Any other questions for from committee members? Richard Lyle. Um, Morning, Minister. You said that there will be a number of patients who can apply to appeal. Do we have a, an idea how many appeals possibly could be and what the total cost may be? I'm, I'm all for people being able to appeal, but uh, can you give us a bit of background in regard to what you believe the total cost will be? I think the only way to answer uh, uh, the first part of the question is how many uh, might appeal. We don't know how many might appeal uh, because... Um, Clearly, it's incumbent on the individuals themselves to, to seek to bring forward an appeal. What we can say is that the Mental Health Inpatient Bed Census, uh, which was published in June of this year, uh, shows the number of uh, patients uh, as at 29th of October 2014 who were uh, in medium secure units. There were 127 uh, patients, and all of them would be uh, eligible to uh, take forward. Uh, or seek to take forward uh, an appeal. Uh, we have uh, provided uh, some uh, detail in terms of uh, what we think the costs might be uh, arising out of uh, this uh, mechanism. That was set out in the Business and Regulatory uh, Impact Assessment estimated costs for the public sector health boards, the uh, Mental Health Tribunal and the Legal Aid Board are around uh, £760,000 per annum. And... Uh who will refund them or will, that, will they be given extra money in regards to this we, regulation? We, or? We, we always seek to fund anything that we deliver, Mr Lyle. I'm happy to hear that, Minister. Thank you. No other questions from members. I now move then to agenda item number two, which is a formal debate on the affirmative SSI, which was, we have just taken evidence. Can I remind uh, the uh, committee and others that, uh, you know, my previous remarks that we, we, we are not at this stage putting questions to the Minister uh, during the formal debate, and officials uh, can no, uh, cannot take part in the debate. Um, can I invite uh, the Minister to move motion uh, before us, S4M 14389? Moved, Convener. Thank you. Um, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? Malcolm Chisholm. I mean, just briefly to explain, I'm, I'm obviously from my question not happy with the regulations, but given that they're consistent with the primary legislation that was passed on the 24th of June, there, there are no grounds for, in my opinion, voting against them. Okay. Any other members? No, no, uh, no other members. I don't know where the, the, the minister feels the need to sum up, but he's free I, to do so. I think there's a steer from you there, can I do not. No, it's fine. Did you move the... You mo you, he did move it, did he not? Right, OK. Um, we they now put the question uh, on the motion. The question is that motion S4M 14389 be approved. Agreed. agreed. We're all agreed. Thank you. Thank you all for your attendance this morning. Uh, we'll pause at this point uh, before we move on to agenda, agenda item number three.
We now um, moved, uh, as I said, to uh, agenda item number three, which is our final evidence session um, on uh, our palliative care inquiry. Before we, uh, you, we begin properly and, and, and uh, address our witnesses, um, um, I'm going to ask for Rhoda and I think myself to just comment on the recent uh, visits we, that, that we undertook to uh, gather evidence with uh, service users and carers at, uh, at uh, Chas, Rachel House in Kinross and uh, Gown Hospice in Greenock. Rhoda, can you, do, can you put some of your reflections, observations on the record, please? Yes. Um, I think the thing probably most striking is kind of a, Rachel House was different to what I, I would have thought of as hospice care. Hospice care, I think, we see as being something very much at the end of life, whereas um, Rachel House was kind of hospice care, pretty much that was lifelong. Um, young people being born with conditions that needed um, a lot of intervention, um, getting the support, and not only the young people, but their families getting the support they needed. Um, so I think that was, I mean, I know hospices deal with the whole family, but sometimes the parents, I think, were getting as much out of Rachel House as the children in that they were getting a break because obviously if you're looking after a child, um, that is continuous. Um, so that they were actually getting a break and the staff there were very clear that they looked after that child in the same way as the parent would look after the child so that the care fitted with what the parent wanted. So I think that was really important and it was kind of a lifeline for people who were using the service and people used the service depending on need rather than anything else. What struck me um, speaking to um, staff and parents as well was the differing levels of support out with Rachel House um, met with two parents who were had probably similar caring responsibilities um, for their children but had totally different care packages at home one had a really good care package, had no complaints whatsoever, um, loads of support and the other had very little um, so I think that's something we need to kind of try and get to the bottom of because it seemed to me, really unfair that um, you know the same kind of level of input required from the parents, but not the same level of support. Um, I think the other thing that was kind of flagged up that we maybe haven't quite dealt with was, um, I suppose, advances in medicine and young people who maybe weren't expected to live very long are now living a lot longer, and there is an age limit to to places like Rachel House. Um, and there needs to be, and I would imagine this is more important, some kind of transition between children and adult services because um, given the level of support given by Rachel House, I think people would become quite dependent on that as a lifeline. But it was a really a really good visit and um, they made us very, very welcome. And, um, you know, the staff and parents were really open about speaking about their own experience and really grateful to them for that. Thanks, Rhoda. Um, just for the record, um, myself, uh, Dennis Robertson and Malcolm Chisholm, and I um, uh, visited Ardgown Hospice. Uh, we uh, had a, a good tour of, of the facilities, especially the facilities that were there. Uh, we were able to engage with uh, the male and female groups of service users and indeed uh, some of the carers, um, uh, you know, uh, at, at the hospice. Um, there were many of these issues, I think, came up. We, you know, bearing in mind we were dealing with a specialist end of the, of the service. Uh, there was, um, I think, um, a high value of the service. Uh, just to summarise, I think that people um, f felt the routes to referral to, to the hospice were, were not always obvious. Um, uh, and, and, you know, being referred to or pointed in that direction um, by clinicians or, or whatever the network wasn't so strong, and many of them found themselves using the wider hospice services because they needed to access the transport system that, that is run by volunteers that, that take them out of the Inverclyde area into uh, mainly cancer services provided 
maybe at the beach, and so that was a very valuable service uh, and support. That, of course, uh, I think we, we heard allowed them to overcome the misconceptions that they felt about the hospice and and, and its care because it, they, they, we, we, we heard in some of the evidence that, um, that outside that and before experiencing the, 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 the services at the hospice, they, they felt that it was some a place to go and end your life. It was a, you know, the, the, uh, and and of course, uh, for for them that wasn't. Some of them had been going for some time. They were provided a uh, you know, very very personalised service that, that that allowed them to seek out peer support, um, uh, to deal with their fears and apprehensions uh, uh, about uh, the, their illness. You know, so as I say, it was a very ha ha highly valued uh, uh, service for those who could. Uh, who could could ac uh, access it, and uh, you know, you know, I don't know where Malcolm or Dennis wish to add anything to that. Um, but, you know, it's just a quick summary of the uh, of 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 our engagement uh, at the hospice. Just a couple of things. Yes. I thought um, the concept of inside out delivery of palliative care. I mean, I, I think it was just a striking phrase. I suppose a soundbite almost, and I'm sure lots of people are doing it in terms of taking services out into the community, but I thought it was quite an interesting way of capturing it. And the second thing that I thought was, well, there were others as well, but just to mention too, was the idea of training people in the community who might be able to assist in signposting potential service users to the hospice and its facilities. And one example of that was hairdressers, just the extent to which people in the community are using them and people talk to their hairdresser and so on. So I thought that was quite an interesting idea as well. Thanks. Anyone else? Um, given that I suppose anyone else re re refers to myself, convener, <laughs> is... Um, <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, primarily, I, I think the, the only thing I'd probably add to, it was the positivity that was around, not just from uh, the, the patients within Argown Hospice, uh, and some of the carers that were there, but the staff themselves, the absolute positivity that was around. I, I certainly didn't witness or hear any negative comments. Um, there were maybe have issues in some areas, but can I say that the issues uh, were seen uh, as <coughs> something that are, they weren't actually barriers, the sort of something that could be overcome. And I think that was the message I, I left with, that regardless of what was there, the issues could be actually addressed, overcome. So it was a huge sense of positivity, and I think to be congratulated. Yes, yes, Annette. I, I wasn't able to go on this particular visit to Rachel House, but I was there. I suppose it must be getting on for 10 years ago. And I absolutely agree with everything Rhoda Grant said about the care of the whole family, not just the, the actual yes. patients. But what, what I think probably struck Rhoda, which wasn't the case when, when I went there, was the fact that these very people with severe disabilities, things like muscular dystrophy, are now surviving into adult life. And that's a different situation than there, than there was a decade ago. I think that has moved on quite significantly. Okay. Thanks for, 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 for that. We now um, move to the evidence session. Thanks for your patience, folks. Um, and we welcome to the committee, Mark uh, Hazelwood, uh, Chief Executive Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care. Uh, David, uh, Dr. David Carroll, Strategic Lead for Palliative Care and End of Life Care NHS Grampian. Uh, Ronald Mayer, Chief Executive of Scottish Care. And David, uh, David Formston, uh, field, work, uh, field Work Manager, Eastern Bartonshire Council Social Work Services and Beth Hall, Policy Manager, Health and Social Care Team, COSLA. Thank you all for uh, your attendance. Uh, the, 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 this morning, and I'll go straight to questions, which I've. Have we can, Dennis? Thank you. And then, you. And then you. Go that thing. <laughs> um, uh, good morning, and uh, I think one of the things that strikes me from the evidence that we've heard, uh, and a lot of the written submissions, is this area around definition. Uh, there seems to be some, and it's not confusion, but there are so many definitions, and I'm just wondering, is the fact that um, the, the different definitions that are out there is a barrier, an obstacle, um, in terms of the provision of palliative care? Uh, because if we look at the, the World Health Organization one, and then we look at GMC, you know, there are differences, and I accept there should be a difference in terms of the, 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 the one for children and young people. 
So is the definition a barrier? Is that causing the, the, the problems in terms of the provision of palliative care? The Carol and then Ronald Mayor. Good morning. Um, I, I have to agree with you, and I was very interested to read Professor David Clark's report to the Scottish Government just the other day when he mentions the fact that there are a lot of definitions there and that these definitions may in fact inhibit, uh, I think he put it, clarity and action. Um, I think that certain definitions are necessary. Uh, generalist palliative care and perhaps specialist palliative care. But palliative care and palliative illnesses are ongoing illnesses. They're a continuum from the point of diagnosis through ultimately to death. And there will be decline uh, and fading timescales. What that person requires and their family require is appropriate care at specific points throughout that illness. Identification and assessment of need is important. Sometimes that need may be very appropriately and easily managed by generalists, in other words, non-specialists in palliative care. At other times, situations, problems may be complicated and we need the input of a specialist palliative care team. The definition end of life, I think, is not good. And there was a very good paper in the BMJ in 2008 which, which stated very clearly that we needed clarification uh, of that definition because people use them very differently. So I agree. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I suppose I, I take a slightly different view from Dr. Carroll. That is that I think the previous iteration of policy in living and dying well uh, broadened out our approach to palliative care from a fairly narrow focus on premature death and linked primarily to cancers. That was the focus around palliative care. What living and dying well did was to broaden out to saying we have to look at end-of-life care for a, a, range of, a, a range of groups and get that right. And indeed, as you can imagine from my own perspective, the inclusion of social care within that was hugely important, that this wasn't just a kind of medical issue, a health issue. This was actually about broader social care provision. There's been a slight danger over the last decades that we've medicalised death. Uh, it's no longer a natural process. It's, uh, it's now uh, something akin to an illness, and that seems to me a, mis a, a misfortune. But even if we just simply look at the numbers, if we look at, at care homes for older people, there are 33,000 people tonight in care homes for older people, all of whom are approaching end of life. And indeed, a large number may have conditions which are in themselves life-shortening but they are not included routinely in definitions of palliative care. Uh, 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 yet I want to ensure, and I imagine you want to ensure, that there is a good death for each of those people uh, uh, and that the care they receive is adequately resourced to deliver on that and indeed that there is access to specialist support when that is, uh, when that is needed. What we don't want, though, is the routine movement of people from a care setting to a hospital in order to access that. Uh, so, so it seems to me that we, the definition does matter, hugely matters, so I think that, that I agree entirely with that. I think there does need to be a continued approach about specialist palliative care provision, but the thrust of policy has to be more encompassing of, of end-of-life care and not re retreat into a narrow focus simply on premature death. Hazelwood? I think, um, I think that the lack of clarity around terminology um, is a problem. Um, and I think sometimes the lack of distinction between um, general palliative care and specialist palliative care and the, the use of, 
I suppose the, the slightly careless use of terms such that um, discussion takes place without people actually being clear what they're um, talking about is a problem. And I think that's compounded by a, a general um, a need to raise professional and public awareness of um, end-of-life issues more generally. Um, and I think in our paper we said that, I mean, set, we, we included the, the formal definitions which have been around for a long time but actually haven't solved this issue of a lack of clarity. And what we've said was that one way of thinking about palliative care is to talk in terms of providing good holistic care to people whose health is in irreversible decline um, or whose lives are coming to inevitable close um, or who have received a, a diagnosis where um, their mortality is going to be impacting on decisions that they may make about what their priorities are. And I think if we try and frame our thinking in those terms, it's then, it's not specialist palliative care or general palliative care, it's thinking about the person as a professional who perhaps is in front of us, what are their needs and circumstances and what matters to them? And part of meeting those needs may be about um, something which can be offered and provided by a generalist service, or it may be that if somebody has more complex needs, uh, then we need to think about accessing specialist services of all sorts, part of which might be specialist palliative care with their particular expertise around um, communication, um, meeting social, psychological needs, and also symptom management as well. Okay. Anyone else? No. Um, hey, Dennis. Uh, if I can continue, convener, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Carl, or perhaps David, um, convener, um, I should declare that uh, Dr. Carl uh, provided the end-of-life care uh, I know he doesn't like the term particularly well, um, uh, for my mother uh, back in 2006. Um, in your submission, uh, Dr. Carl, you said that accessibility to the care should be based on um, clinical need and not diagnosis. Is this the, the holistic approach that uh, Mark Hazelwood was talking about? Yes, and I, I think one of the great strengths of living and dying well was that it stated very clearly that need was the, the prime mover for the care that was delivered, not the diagnosis. And as Ranald said, at, as we sit in, in, at this moment in time in Edinburgh, the vast majority of people with palliative illnesses and therefore the vast amount of palliative need is actually out in the community. It is not in hospitals, it is not in hospices. Therefore, the vast amount of palliative care that is being provided at this moment in time will be by generalists, largely primary care teams. Um, therefore, irrespective of the diagnosis, the person and the family will have needs those needs need to be addressed. They need to be assessed, uh, having been identified and addressed appropriately and as promptly as is possible. Um, that, if we don't get right, means there will be a large amount of unmet need in the community. I agree with Ranald. Sometimes that need will be physical, symptom control, Sometimes it will be social, a lack of support, carer. Sometimes it will be emotional, just as the World Health Organization defines palliative care. Therefore, palliation is holistic. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Fornston. Um, I mean, just to follow on from what's said, I mean, I, th I think it's... Uh, uh, recognise that the previous reports in 2008 and also the Audit Scotland report and the report on children in 2012, um, I think inevitably focused on clinical pathways, on relationships between um, secondary care and, and primary care, uh, perhaps didn't focus as much on um, the social psychological aspects. And I think what we need to do is, is be much clearer um, about pathways, about uh, the fact that most people um, are going to be within the community um, for most of their end-of-life care, um, that 
links, you know, which hopefully will be um, helped by the new integration of integrated joint bodies, um, so that there are a good pathways from hospital um, into the community, including voluntary agencies and, and a range of support agencies. Um, and that, that, that the hope would be, I suppose, to minimise the number of readmissions into hospital um, and also to make sure that there's good discharge planning. Um, clearly not everybody is going to need a social worker, um, but um, social work core skills, I suppose, focus on what was being talked about, about good assessment, about good support planning, um, he helping people where possible, put together flexible packages of support through things like self-directed support, um, and direct payments, so they retain control uh, for as long as possible, um, right up to the um, end of life, um, and that there's good multidisciplinary working between social workers, um, occupational therapists, many of whom work in the local authority, and a range of health practitioners. Is that your cue, Beth? Is that your cue? Um, sort of. I don't have a great deal to, to add because I think the, the discussion has drawn out the points that, that I would have made, but maybe just to reflect back to, to the start of, of that discussion there where Mark was talking about um, a different kind of definition, a different way of, of thinking about um, palliative care, because although I don't think you said the word the word outcomes, but I, but I felt that was very much um, the, the meaning behind, behind what you were saying. And I think if we take um, that approach where it leads us to is thinking about services differently and moving away from that very um, clinical understanding of, of palliative care, which tends to fo focus on the acute, um, on acute provision at t towards the end of life. Um, so I would have to agree with, with both um, Ranald and David as, as well in terms of the role for that much more person-centred approach. And I think that does... That does give us some challenges in terms of how we think about services and the way we, we would normally classify services around specialist palliative care, general, general palliative care. But I think that's very much the, the, right, the right way to be going. Okay. But can, we, can we sort of probe this a wee bit then? If, 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 if we agree, uh, with, uh, Dr Carroll, that uh, in hospices we get that specialist care, it's 24 hours... Uh, the, there's, there are lots of people around and in, in my experience uh, it's quite intensive and it's range of support at the clinical at the end of death the, you know, and indeed the people we spoke to last week, lots of support dealing with that emotional uh, aspect uh, of, of, of this, often different um, you know, relaxation, you know, all, all, you know, all of these new um, um, you know, available uh, help in stressful situations. How do we compare that with what happens in the community? Can I come back yeah, in that, on yes, this? Yes, yes. Th thank you. I mean, I think it, you know, given your reports earlier on some of your visits, I think it might be important that you were also <laughs> touching base with those people who either provide care in care homes and co in homely settings, or indeed in care, care at home services, where they are also supporting people as they, as they move towards, uh, towards end of life. Because I think we've got to get a consistency of approach. And some of that means upskilling the workforce in those other settings so that they are uh, 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 positively a, a, a aware of the agendas around uh, around dying. I, I think there has been quite a significant improvement over the the, the last uh, six years since living and dying well. I think we have actually uh, seen less traffic of people from care homes to hospital at end of life. We've seen more investment by uh, care organisations and, and more support to them from organisations like Macmillan and Marie Curie uh, to try and develop their capacity to provide positive end of life care. However, not not surprisingly within that, there are agendas around, around resourcing and making sure that's adequate. The, ad the, the average staffing level in a care home for older people at the moment is one member of staff to five residents. That's woefully inadequate. What would it be it, uh, I, I don't have the, the figures, no, no, but no, better. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm sorry, somebody, somebody else. Yes, yes. Mayor, yeah. 
significantly better than that. Yes, <laughs> yes. We did, we did just, you know, I didn't mention, and none of us mentioned, we did meet, obviously, people. Our Gown Hospital provides uh, uh, care in, in the community and at home and provides those support. Now, we also engage with the wider partners who were delivering some of that social care. Uh, which they made your argument, but I take, I take your point. Maybe we could have done more. But I know this is this is not the arena to, to carry the debate about resourcing forward. It, it, but I do think that there, that if we do want to have an even standard of provision of end of life care across different settings, people in their own homes, people in care settings, people in hospices, people in hospital, then there has to be a, a, a greater. A evenness, a level playing field about how services are resourced and indeed the supports available to draw on. So it, was, it would simply be to, to, to lodge that point. Yeah. Mr Formster. Um, I, mean, I think inevitably there is a resource issue. I mean, it is about training. It's about, as Ranald says, upskilling uh, ordinary care at home workers who are going to be um, seeing the majority of people we're, we're talking about. Um, but, but it's also recognising, I suppose, the fact that if we're talking about, for example, overnight care, weekend and evening care, that certainly local authority um, home care services, whether it's direct services or commission services, purchasing services, are, are really not geared up to providing that um, intensity of support over um, a number of weeks and months. So there's a, a service aspect to it. There's also a... Um, um, a personal care funding aspect in that, in that, as you'll know, free personal care for people over 65 is free, uh, but not for people under 65. So it means that uh, numbers of people under the age of 65 who, who need intensive support at home uh, are going to have to pay for it and they're going to have to probably pay the maximum charge um, in order to receive that care. Um, you'll also be aware of the... Um, the virtual demise of continuing care, the recent uh, circular that came out a couple of months ago, which, uh, unlike in England, um, effectively says that unless if somebody can be cared for anywhere else apart from a hospital, that they, they should do so, and basically the NHS will not fund that care. Uh, this contrasts quite starkly, I think, with the uh, UK Parliament Health Committee report that came out in March, which firstly said that all social care funding should be free for everybody um, and secondly that there should be a lot more promotion of the use of continuing care uh, for people neither of which will now apply within Scotland. Thank you Dr. Dr. Carroll. If, if I, I may use figures. Yeah. In 2012 uh, in NHS Grampian 5,318 people died. 3.7% of those deaths occurred in the hospice which is a tiny minority. Of the people who died, 88% were over the age of 60 when they died. 75% were over the age of 70 when they died. So we're looking at people at the end of their lives who require care. This is not the cancer population. This is very much a changing spectrum of palliative care. If we aim to enable these people or more of these people to stay at home for as long as possible and ultimately die in their own home, we need a workforce. That workforce is not just important in terms of you know, people at the coal face. It has to be a workforce that has a sufficient knowledge base and skill base to identify and deal with the problems that these unfortunate people are going to have if they are to remain at home safely and in comfort. The other thing that is likely to be required is some form of respite. Looking after someone at home in the last weeks of, of their life can be physically and emotionally exhausting. If there are family members who are fit, they may be able to carry that burden. But given the, the figures that I've shown and the age of these people, the main carer may be also quite old and with their own medical problems and therefore unable to sustain that level 
of care. So they need help. Respite is important for the, pa for the patient and the carer. And it's a, almost a reflection of, of what you were saying, Mr. Chisholm. It's the out, the in, but out. That care could be given at home, or that respite care may require an admission to some unit. Beth Hall, and I see uh, David Formson wishing to come back in. Mark? Yeah, just picking up this issue, the, I suppose really the question which came about in terms of the contrast between what happens in a hospice and what may happen elsewhere. And I, I suppose the, the, the point about this is that um, we need to have good care in all settings. Um, and um, as we know, over half of uh, deaths in Scotland occur in hospital. And, um, and I, there's some aspiration to reduce that as a percentage. But we know that uh, there will continue to be a very significant number of people whose end-of-life care is provided in a hospital setting. We've heard from Ranald also about the numbers of people who um, are living in care homes for the elderly towards the end of life. Uh, so we have to to get this right across all settings. And I would I would just agree with the points that have been made about the need for um, resourcing to do that. And I know that in the care home field, for example, if you look at the levels and complexity of needs of people who are now in care homes compared to five or ten years ago, it's a very different population. And we need to to resource that and also to think about the implications for that in terms of um, education. We need to think also about, um, so there's, a, there's a, an issue about education. There's lots of great um, education resources out there, um, but what we don't have is a, a comprehensive and systematic framework which acknowledges that um, palliative and end-of-life care is the core business or one of the major core businesses of our health and social care system. So if you are in that system, what are the core competences that you should have in order to play your part in terms of providing that good care across all settings? And so we need to develop that sort of framework, perhaps a little bit like um, the framework for excellence that was put in place for dementia. I think we should be thinking about that for palliative and end-of-life care. We need to embed palliative and end-of-life care education within... Um, undergraduate curriculums as well. I think then there's a question about um, culture also. There's some very, very good end-of-life care in hospitals, but our hospitals will largely come from a model of um, cure, um, and we need to try and make them places uh, where it's possible for good holistic care uh, to be provided in circumstances where cure isn't possible. And I think that's a challenge in busy acute hospitals, but there are some good examples of care. Uh, but we need to have a bit of a culture shift around that and recognise that, again, a big part of what Scotland's acute hospitals do is to provide care for people in their last year of life. Beth Hall. Thanks. Um, it was just to, to pick up on a couple of points that the, the previous speakers made. Um, I mean, I have to agree wholeheartedly in terms of the need to develop the workforce. Um, and to use the workforce more flexibly. Um, there are, as, as previous discussion has indicated, there are a wide range of staff in many different settings who um, do play a role in palliative care um, and also who could potentially pay, play a much greater role. Um, however, if we're talking about developing the, the skills base and the knowledge base with, within the workforce, that does require investment. Um, I think several people have, have highlighted that. Um, and there are some real challenges there, some, some big political issues about um, you know, an ongoing desire to protect investment um, in the NHS, often at the expense of an investment within local government. Um, I mean, that's taken place against a backdrop of a situation where we, we as a society don't value social care in, in the same way that we do NHS care. Um, we're not willing to, to pay decent wages for it which then causes problems with recruitment and retention within the workforce. Um, and against that backdrop, it is very, very difficult to look at upskilling staff and, and asking them to take on more responsibilities, responsibilities that may be out with their professional boundaries traditionally, yet we're not able to provide... Um, uh, comp um, we're not able to provide an, in an increase in, in benefits to, to staff for that. Um, that does 
absolutely nothing to help recruitment and retention problems and, and in, in some cases I would say it makes it worse. Um, we also started to, to touch on the, the role of carers um, and I think we recognise that people um, people who provide unpaid care are absolutely key to, to our health and social care system. Without them, um, it would just collapse. Um, however, in recent years, what, what we've seen is, is a dialogue around um, a very um, superficial approach to, um, to carers. We've got a, a piece of legislation going through just now that, that we've, I know this committee has, has been examining, um, which will introduce a universal entitlement to assessment for carers. Um, however, that doesn't equate to an entitlement to support, and actually it will divert resources away from that support budget. Um, so I think we really do need to, to take a step back here and, and look at the, the bigger picture in the round um, of what's, what's going on with, within the system um, that's producing the, the outcomes and the variation and the issues that we're, we're all talking about here today. Arnold Mayor and David Formstone. Just, just one quick kind of pick up on, on points, and, and particularly, I mean, the, the points that David and me were saying very positive. Uh, there are parts of the country where we are unable to recruit the workforce. This is not just an issue about, there is an issue about resourcing, there is an issue about training, but actually we've got to promote careers and care. Parts of Grampian are particularly problematic at this point. Aberdeenshire, uh, very hard to, to recruit the people we need. So we need a workforce to deliver the care. Um, they, we've also got to make sure that we're maintaining the, cap the, the capacity, the volume of care. We're actually delivering, uh, contrary to what you might expect, given the demography, we are delivering home care to 10,000 fewer people now than we were 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were delivering home care, including the traditional home health service, to 60,000 people. We are now delivering care at home to 50,000. The numbers have gone down. A lot of people may be getting more intensive care packages. The hours of care being delivered have increased, but the number of people receiving care at home has decreased. Similarly, with respite, we're actually seeing a reduction in respite services and people's access to those. So if our goal is to support individuals and their families to end of life, we have to make sure that we're, man that we're maintaining the volumes of care that we require of different kinds and that we're managing successfully to recruit people I I into, into working in, in, in those settings. And that is proving hugely challenging right at this point. Okay. David, okay. just to go back to training that uh, Dr Carroll was talking about, um, I mean, I think because of the... Uh, um, focus on, on clinical matters, which I, I started with, um, I suppose training for social care, social work stuff has tended to lag behind and I was sort of acknowledged that we maybe could, be, could be more proactive than, than we have been. But home carers going in three or four times a day who are the uh, people who know uh, the, the patient or the, uh, the customer best uh, are no different from anywhere else and uh, anybody else in terms of their feelings about death and m mortality and maybe hoping somebody else will uh, take on on the care, and I think there are some good um, examples of initiatives um, in Renfrewshire and I think North Ayrshire, where there's been partnerships between um, home care agencies, um, uh, hospices, the local hospice, and uh, I think in Renfrewshire, community psychiatric nurses, so off their own bat to set up training programmes for home carers, and I think if that could be uh, replicated across the country with maybe um, you know el electronic training and and some funding that would be good uh, similarly social workers i think in in their training professional training courses i think this is a, a probably another topic to be added on to a, a number of other topics but but is, is an area i think that needs to be much more promoted um, as i said earlier most people will not necessarily need to come near a social worker they'll have good family support other people will be um, a lot more vulnerable isolated may lack mental capacity and there's a number of areas where um, social workers can intervene not only in um, supporting them with, with um, delivering services, practical aspects around housing and, and welfare benefits, um, but, but also 
um, helping with advanced planning, uh, bereavement work with families once per the person has died, um, but, but also working with a person in their last stages of life. We've talked about the sort of psychological, emotional um, elements to help people come to terms, talk about their feelings and, and their concerns about um, dying, um, to do things like maybe writing letters to people, um, to, um, I mean, there's some examples of things like life storybooks, helping people take stock of their lives. Um, and Beth has mentioned, obviously, the whole thing about support to carers. So there's a, a huge range of uh, um, social work, which is maybe not sort of explicit, but there are uh, work with people with long-term conditions, uh, work with people with dementia as well as people with cancer, and I think that's an area for development. Dr. Carl. As we discuss workforce and skill mix and education, I, I think we have to be always mindful of the fact that 70% of the week is now deemed out of hours. And therefore, we also require a workforce out of hours which has the same qualities uh, and skill mix as that in, the, in ours. Illness, unfortunately, is not a respecter of Monday to Friday, nine to five. Problems exist, deteriorations, uh, uh, acute symptoms. Uh, are, I suppose, statistically more likely to happen out of ours than they are in ours. We plan care, we plan handovers uh, to the out of our service, and we have the key information summary, and we do our best. But unfortunately, all illnesses, particularly palliative illnesses, have two components. There is a degree of predictability, but unfortunately, there is also a degree of unpredictability, and that is the problem. Uh, we have to be prepared for the things that we cannot predict happening. Well, the, the, David, I'm going to. Uh, get, I've got the members here who wish we could come back in to thank the witnesses for their their, their, their engagement this morning. It's almost like a, a panel we've got here this morning, so we've been taught a lesson to to listen for a wee while. But I've got Rhoda and Richard, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to turn to equity of service. We talked briefly about people with um, life-shortening conditions and that them usually having more access to palliative care um, and then kind of open that up to people towards the end of their lives. One of the things that struck me, certainly at Rachel House, was the different um, palliative care available in different areas depending on the health board or the local authority. And I wonder how we can, can I suppose, get a minimum level of service that people can expect um, at the, towards the end of their lives so that some people aren't getting exceptionally good care. I think we hear of exceptionally good care being available, but we also hear of people being pretty much left. And quite often those are the ones that fall back on A&E &E and the like when families no longer are able to cope. And nobody wants to die in hospital if they could die comfortably at home. So how, how do we do that? Mr Hazelwood, and I, th I think Mr Mayor. Yeah, we obviously... A, a across the health and social care system we hear about kind of postcode lotteries. I think in this instance, if you think about, as we've heard, the bulk of palliative care being provided within generalist settings, um, it may even not be to do with your postcode, the sort of support and access you get. It may be much more at a, a micro level about who are the health and social care professionals uh, who you happen to encounter. So. Um, there's some data around um, GP's level of comfort in terms of um, initiating and conducting discussions about people's uh, preferences for care um, towards the end of life. And we know that some GPs are more comfortable and able to do that than others. So it may not be about um, where you live, but the particular uh, general practitioner who may be able to, may be more comfortable to take forward those discussions than another. And then if you think about um, perhaps an admission to hospital with a sudden deterioration, um, again, it may come down to whether you're um, admitted to a ward where the staff have been <clears throat> able to have access to training and support and who are uh, comfortable um, and enabled to use that skills and knowledge to provide your care. Um, so it, 
And I think that's why I would want to come back and emphasize the importance of a of, of comprehensive um, education and training, because I think that is the way in which we can start to um, address the, the slightly arbitrary nature of what people experience in terms of general palliative care. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I can simply, I mean, in part, echo what Mark said and add to it. Uh, I mean, I think the, the stands for excellence in terms of I think the parallels with dementia are quite useful to us here. We have tried to make inroads on, on relation to dementia by setting educational standards, comprehensive educational standards for people working in the sector, whether as specialist staff or even generalist staff within, certainly within social care. Um, we've also, for instance, I mean, the government has set um, the requirement for one year post-diagnostic support for people with dementia. Uh, and I, so again, there's a kind of saying, here's what you can expect if, you, if, you're, if, you've, if you've got a diagnosis of dementia, here's what you can expect. And perhaps we have to move in a similar direction in terms of saying, here are the things you can expect. There are standards. We're at the point of the review of the national care standards taking place, looking for them to become more human rights embedded, Going, going forwards, but, we, but you know, within the next two years, we're likely to have a new framework of national care standards. It would be important that palliative and end-of-life care were anchored, embedded within that framework uh, uh, of standards uh, going forward. So I think we should use some of the mechanisms we've already got and, and some of the things that have worked for, for tackling other areas. We've improved, say, for dementia, we've improved by introducing national standards for things like tissue viability uh, um, and other areas. So, so I think we, we use the things, the mechanisms that we, we can actually say, well, that's made a difference to that area of care. Can we apply the same sort of approach, a joined up approach? Um, uh, that we, that, and that's more possible now given integration at, at a local level, and indeed even between the regulatory bodies and the improvement services are coming more aligned. So Health Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate are working more together uh, and perhaps can be provide a vehicle for driving standards of end of life, palliative and end of life provision across health settings or social care settings. Beth and then Dr Carl. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Possibly um, two of the biggest issues in terms of access are, are around um, a the, the reach of specialist palliative care service if, services, if you like, and trying to improve um, how that reaches into settings beyond the hospital and, and out into the community. Um, I won't speak to the, the challenges around that because I think there are colleagues who are here who have who are better able to do that. But I recognise that there are resource issues there, the same as there are um, for local government. Um, I think, secondly, um, the thing that we, things that we can do in terms of improving um, equity of access is about that upskilling, that, that greater use of, of generalist um, services that we've already spoken about. Um, we've already mentioned recruitment and retention difficulties, so I'll, I'll not dwell on that. Um, however, the other area where, where we need to be looking is in terms of um, improving the, the flexibility and availability um, of commissioned services. And that's partially about, yes, about the commissioning behaviour of the, the integrated joint boards. We're, we're in a shadow year for them, so it's very much um, watch the space in that sense. But also recognising that just as rural areas have real challenges around recruitment and retention of staff, they also have challenges um, around the range of providers that are operating within the area. Um, so I think, again, that's a real challenge for integrated joint boards as they develop their joint strategic commissioning strategies um, and looking at how you can support different types of, of provision and more innovative types of provision is something that those partnerships are, are doing. So whether it's um, in the Murray area, um, looking at how you support micro providers um, or in other areas, it's about looking at how you um, work with the providers in your area in a much more um, integrated and open way around projecting what the needs of the population are likely to be and having an, an open discussion about the provision that will be needed now, next year and, and into the next 10 years. Mr. Um, in terms of Ms. Grant's point about equity, I mean, I suppose it is partly, as Mark says, a um, certain amount of geographical inequity uh, where there happen to be flagship uh, projects. Um, but 
there are obviously people who die or dying or as, as diverse as the, the whole population. Um, there will be, if you like, hard to reach or groups who don't engage with um, services like uh, substance misusers, homeless people. Um, there'll be people in prison um, who need um, special attention. Um, but but a, a major group I'd want to emphasize is people with learning disability. Um, increasingly, as you know, people with learning disabilities survive uh, well into adult, adulthood and um, old age. Many of them are now cared for um, within supported accommodation units or will be known to social work and have particular needs. They. Um, Although they lack capacity, I mean, they often, uh, research would suggest they can still express choices about where they would like to um, spend the rest of, of their lives. Uh, we know that people with learning disability don't do well in hospital um, for a number of reasons I won't go into. Um, the care homes may or may not be, may be not geared up to uh, meeting their needs. Uh, there'll be medical aspects like the difficulty of assessing the pain that somebody with a, um, a learning disability experience um, there's, there's, they may lack a sense of time in terms of when is the best time to try and engage with them and to talk about end of life, which they may Im immediately think is, is, is imminent. Um, there are uh, various tools that we need to develop, I think, that are more accessible to work with people with a, um, a learning disability. So that, that's a whole area I think I'm acknowledging we need to uh, be much better at. If I may, to go back to the dreaded resources issue, though, that does mean that if we um, continue to maintain people at home or within supported units, that, it, that there are major staffing implications of doing that. You're often then talking about one-to-one -one or, or two-to-one support, and that is a hugely um, expensive um, exercise, but it's something that we're absolutely uh, committed to, because uh, as I say, moving um, somebody with a learning disability or uh, autism at, at, at a, a point of change or whatever is, is, is um, certainly best avoided, and, and, um, but it's, it's something that is increasingly challenging challenging in terms of resources for us. It's been said. It's been said. Thank you. Thank you. Rhoda, you're... Just, just a, a small point. I mean, someone mentioned rural areas, but sometimes the best care is in rural areas because people know each other, the whole team knows each other, the GP knows, the community nurse knows, the care worker, they all roll up their sleeves and get their heads together, make it work, and Sky, where Macmillan works with Boots and the community nurses to make sure that they have kind of a, a, a drugs available for people at the end of life. There's really good examples. Where it seems to fall down is where you've got big teams with demarked um, roles and that, and nobody taking responsibility. And I don't know if we maybe need to look at somebody, a named person in end of life care, where overseas that that care is happening and the teams are are called in in more urban areas where you've got people who don't speak to each other every day and discuss patient care. Hello. To respond to, to the point you make, I mean, it, 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 again, if we drew, draw the parallel with dementia, the whole purpose of the one-year post-diagnostic support was to have a coordinating worker. That was what that person's role was to be, to help the family and the individual come to terms with diagnosis and to, uh, uh, and, and to coordinate the support around that person. <laughs> and, and I think there, is a, there, there, there could be scope. But whether it's... I, I think there's... The, the, there's such a debate around the use of the very named person in, in, uh, in relation to children's legislation. But, but I think uh, having a key worker, uh, a coordinating presence around the care for somebody where there is, where, 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 uh, 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 could well be a, a, a positive model to look at. Carl? I, I would agree. And, and I, I think the, that sometimes small is beautiful. And that the, the, there is that continuity and cohesiveness in smaller rural communities. And I've certainly witnessed that in NHS Grampian. Uh, as an old and ageing general practitioner, I am very keen uh, that there is someone in control or organising uh, a lot of the care. <coughs> Palliative care in a community setting is becoming multi-stranded. And someone... I, you don't want the strands to be all tangled randomly. You want them to be pulled together in a cohesive way to maximise the quality that that individual patient gets. 
I think my question would fit in at this point. I mean, there's been a lot of talk, inevitably, about um, workforce, about resource. So has, has any work actually been done on the, the actual financial implications of a comprehensive, good palliative care system across Scotland? It may have been an impossible one to answer, I don't know. But I just wonder, has any work been done on that? Because it would be interesting to know just how far short we are financially. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. So it's not a, a definitive answer to, to the point, but we can do cost comparisons between the cost of having somebody in hospital and the cost of supporting people in the community, even if that, even uh, making the case for additional investment that we are doing. It, this ought to be a, an area of policy where there's a win-win, that actually there's a gain to the public purse and to improved outcomes for the individual and their family. So, so I mean, I, I haven't seen this as an area where this was saying there has to be an overall you know, explosion of resource or the major increase in resource. I think it is about how we spend and distribute the pot of money that's there to best advantage. Uh, uh, you know, the cost of having somebody in a general hospital ward is £1,400 a week, uh, upwards. If they're in an acute hospital bed, it's between three or £4,000 a week. You could do a lot with that in the community. That's a lot of hours of home care. That's several places in a care home. That's a whole lot of respite care. Now, the, it isn't as simple as that because there isn't a straight reallocation of resource if you keep somebody out of hospital. We understand that. But um, I, think, I think we've got to really encourage people to be saying, and that's why I think we were always saying politicians love to defend the NHS and hospitals. Uh, actually, I, this committee in particular has to be a defender of both health and social care and about actually the, the best use of resources to achieve the end, res, end results uh, um, uh, and, and some redistribution of the existing resource pot may be important before we start coming to you and saying, or coming to the government and saying there will have to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a major increase in the in in in, in the resource allocation. Beth, um, sorry, like like Ranald nor do I have a, a figure of, of you know how much it, it would require. You know, par partially because that depends on on where you would want to set the bar in in terms of what kind of um, service you would want to see, but also because. <laughs> I think some of the points we've, we've been discussing are around um, the need for a wide range of different services and staffing groups to be playing a greater role in especially generalist palliative care. So that, that makes it very difficult to, to pull, out, um, pull out figures. But, for example, there are particular areas of work that we know are, would be contributing to, to that vision. So, for example, COSLA is currently in discussion with Scottish Government around investment to um, lift wage levels within the care at home sector to, you know, to the level of, of the living wage. Now, we've, we've heard around the, the table today that we would want to, to do more here, that we would want to be looking at the core training that happens at college and, and university and having a focus within there, that we want to be looking at Ranald's being clear. It's, it's not simply lif lifting to, to living wage is not going to solve the, the workforce issues that we know we have. Ranald's been quite clear that we need to have a career pathway. We need to, to see social care as, as a good career. So you would be able to cost those Kind of elements of things, but it's not it's not an exercise that has been done that I'm aware of. I think I think Bob's going to you you, you want to pursue this the, this question. I'll give you an opportunity to come just, back in. Mark. I, I, just very just very briefly on on because I had a couple of little kind of mini questions. I'll, I'll hold off the second one because I know Richard Lyle's in, in before me. But just on on training, I, I kind of mentioned it before in the chamber. Career pathways and social care was one of the kind of major things that stood out for myself. You know, as well have family members uh, being cared for in residential units and seen the, the huge and amazing and outstanding job that care workers do under under huge pressure. And some will be there for 20, 30 years doing that job, but others will see it as a as a pathway through to something else. Quite often, it's a filler, and the pathway is not necessarily staying within health and social care. And it's how we get that pathway to retain people in health and social care. And is there is there scope for accreditation towards social work degrees, for example, if you do a year or two years in a care home or 
nursing degrees are heaven for fend that some of our medics out there that go into senior posts within the NHS uh, do a turn in a care home for a year and actually get to see what good quality social care looks like at the coalface uh, as opposed to uh, some of the clinical decisions they take in terms of care. So do we have to think more, m m more cute about how we provide not just building the status of social care, because I'm not, I'm not looking for an exit strategy for people out of social care, it should be seen as a status job in its own right, but is there, is there other ways we have to look at recruitment and retention about career pathways through social care for a broader range of people? Well, that was one of the two, two questions that I had. Can we not thought this was an appropriate bit to, to perhaps raise it? Do you want to come in at this point, Mark? Because I cut you off the last time or you. Do you want yes. Ronald to take this part over? Uh, it was just to on? pick up on Nanette's, okay. Nanette's question. Um, so I'm not aware of a piece of work that's been done. Um, and I think that's really because, as we've said, a lot of um, the care that's provided for people is provided in generalist settings, and it's difficult to pick that out and a, a, attach a particular price tag to it. I think in terms of improving things, though, what I wanted to say was there are one or two big ticket items, and those are items which aren't specific to palliative care. So we know that we've talked quite a lot about the need to, to, to ensure an adequate social care workforce. We've talked also, and obviously there's a lot of work going on at the moment around capacity and general practice. Um, but I, I think there's a lot that can be done, and um, just referring to the report that we, we provided to committee members uh, grasping the nettle, you know, what, what can we actually do to improve power and end-of-life care? And we've set out there 37 quite specific actions, and some of those are big ticket, but there's an awful lot that can be done that isn't going to necessarily be um, terribly expensive. And what struck... Um, my organization in engaging with our 50 plus member organizations is the degree of um, consensus about some uh, actions which will really will move this field forwards. Um, I think as a field we quite often struggle as you've experienced to to come up with clear definitions but actually if you ask people what needs to be done to improve the experience of the Scottish population in terms of living with advanced disease and being supported to make the most of their time to die well and to be supported in bereavement. We've actually discovered there's quite a lot of consensus around that. And uh, one example, and it's a small ticket item I would suggest, is that there's a huge amount that can be done if we promote um, public awareness, um, public understanding of the importance and value to themselves of learning a bit about um, decisions and choices towards the end of life and in thinking about whether there's somebody who wants to make a bit of a plan to have a discussion with their GP about what they might like should their health care deteriorate. Um, I think we've really only just started uh, to explore the potential of working um, collaboratively, collaboratively with the Scottish public um, and I think if we can start to do that through some uh, promotion of a more open culture of discussion, then there's huge scope for improvement. And all these barriers that I know you've explored extensively about whose job is it to start the conversation and when, well, if we um, as professionals and public are able to be a bit more open about these things and it becomes a bit more normal to have discussions and to do a bit of thinking and planning ahead, then those barriers and difficulties will start to move away. And that needs some investment, but it, it, it's not a vast investment that's required to do that sort of public awareness work. And there's good work happening, as you know, uh, with good life, good death, good grief, and similar initiatives. Mr. Mayor? Just quickly to pick up on Mr. Dorsey's point, I mean, I, I think there is work ongoing to articulate qualifications more clearly so people can use you know, the, the credits from their SVQs that they may do if they're working in a care home or a care at home setting. Uh, towards their social work qualification, or uh, similarly, there's, there's, we're looking at nursing pathways uh, uh, again. However, that, that almost tends to reinforce the sense that you move on to something better. I actually want us to value the people who provide frontline care. Uh, I, I visited Sweden some years back, and they are uh, visiting children's homes. The people that work in children's homes there are their highest status qualified remunerated people they have to do a social work qualification and then 
a, a qualification and training in residential care. In other words, they've, they've, they've turned it upside down. They just, they, they, you know, so they can't quite understand why we see people who work in residential settings or in social care as being the kind of lower uh, level of the, wor of, 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 of the workforce. So my, so my only reservation is that we continue to reinforce the sense that, that social care is something you'd want to get out of and move on to something better, whereas actually what we have to do is to uh, reward and, and, and value uh, those roles more, 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 more strongly. We, uh, Mr. Formson, just briefly. Just a brief point on Mr. Dor Doris's point, I suppose, about um, internal gradings within home care. I mean, um, I'm sure this is uh, um, work in progress, but um, you know, it, without turning home carers into specialist uh, palliative care workers, I mean, we have to recognise the new world of integration and the fact that uh, health and social care are coming together, and um, key areas like uh, medication, uh, administration of medication, which at the moment home carers can't do, but if, if they were properly trained and graded and if there was an agreement uh, which would free up uh, nurses, an agreement with trade unions or whatever, that's certainly something that could be looked at rather than them just being able to prompt people, they could actually administer uh, medication. Just, just on this, I mean, it isn't just about the wage rates or the status of these people, is it? I mean, you know, it's an adversarial system. The private sector is involved, the third sector is involved. Um, in social care and care in the community. Um, the idea that you would say in the health service you've only got 15 minutes with that person, the, the continuity of care, that, well, you can, you, you've got a chance to respond, Beth, if, if you know, the 15-minute visit, the ding of the microwave, you know, that, you know the, the, there's limited times with people that you're caring for or, or indeed continuity of care where you can have 15, 20, 30, you know, 25 different carers. And, you know, that, that type of adversarial system would not be tolerated in the health service. So it's not just about, uh, you know, valuing some individuals at the bottom. This is, there's two systems operating here, which, which, which one is heavily regulated and the, and the, and the other is less regulated. Is it not? less regulated it's i mean this is all down to commissioning it's not that those providers are choosing to provide 15 minutes most of them are fundamentally opposed to it uh, but it is the fact that and it's a real sadness particularly around older people's care because of the higher volumes that we've got compared with learning disability compared with child care because of the higher volumes we want to offer each older person less and we want to get it for less money it's to do with uh, trying to make stretched budgets go further. So what do you do? You dilute the amount of time. It's to do with commissioning. I, I, you know, the problem could be solved if there was a will to do it, to say, well, actually, we want, to, we want home care workers to spend more time with the person. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that, that's to do with what the, the commissioner, which is usually the public body, is saying... It wants people to deliver. Uh, actually, if, if, the, if any of these independent organisations that are delivering home care over exceed their hours, they get penalised. If they stay with Mrs Smith and don't make it to Mrs Jones uh, in time for the next 15-minute visit, they get penalised, actually. And, and so you're right to say that it's, if you, 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 I wasn't quite sure what you would mean by the adversarial, it's certainly a system which doesn't, isn't needs-based um, uh, and where the constraints are to do with uh, the, the, the available uh, funding uh, for, for, for care and, as I say, it disadvantages older people by comparison with every other group of, uh, of, 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 of service users. Yes, Beth? You know, in terms of Ranald's quite um, clearly laid out the, the issues uh, behind behind fifteen minute visits, and, and I don't I don't think it's helpful to to character, characterise this as um, you know a problem that's present within one part of the system and, and not not within the other to, to any degree. Um, you know, the point here is about the amount of time that is required to deliver the outcomes that we want to see. We're trying to move towards outcome based um, commissioning. That said, that takes place within a resource envelope which is becoming 
ever, ever tighter. The, the, the pressure that social work budgets are under and have been under for a number of years now, it's just simply not sustainable. Um, and I think several times throughout this session, we've, we've talked about the need for a wider debate around that. That is the elephant in the room, and we're, we're starting to see the, the impact of, of that. Um, <laughs> at risk of, of just repeat, repeating myself and, and coming off the, the, the topic around palliative care, I think um, what Mark was saying earlier about a, a public debate around a, a willingness to, to talk about, a greater willingness to talk about death and dying as being a cost-effective route into addressing some of these issues, I, I have to agree. But I think we also need to ensure that that debate focuses on the, the, the fundamental issues around how much are we willing to pay for care? Um, because the amount we're willing to pay for it at the moment is, is producing the, the outcomes that we're, we're, we're here concerned about today. Richard yes, sir. I've been sitting, uh, good morning, sitting fascinated with uh, both uh, David Carroll and Ronald Mayer's comments, and um, basically Mark Hazelwood covered the point I was, I, I was going on to, and, and I think we really have to, the, the point that Beth Hall is making, we have to really have a possible reassessment. We do a good job, but maybe we need to look at how we're providing and, and whatever. And can I even throw in that um, we've got a lot of ex-nurses out there who have left uh, and could do this job, maybe have a family, could uh, come back into the, the setting that uh, uh, Dr David Carroll was making. But can I move on to the main question I was going to... I had to say that, uh, convener. my apologies. Public awareness and information, and Mark Hazelwood covered it slightly. Um, we've all been in the set, and none of us like to talk about death. None of us like to talk about what we're going to happen. Uh, I, I nearly laughed, uh, Dr Carroll, about you. I don't think you're old. Uh, and basically, you've got a long, please stay, we need you. We need you as long as we can. Um, but basically, the situation is that um, a lot of people don't want to talk about death, don't want to talk about what's going to happen if they, they move into palliative care. So how do we raise public awareness? How do we inform people? How do we, um, you know, how do we move this cultural shift in Scotland in order to get people to talk? I've made a will. I made a will years ago. My, my, my son knows how, what I, my son and my daughter know how I want to be um, um, cremated or how, how my service is going to be, etc., etc., etc. But a lot of people... I had a, my mother-in-law, father-in-law, when they were unfortunately getting to near the end of life, didn't want to talk about it, didn't, didn't want to discuss it. You know, so how do we involve people? How do we set up a campaign? How do we ensure that people get their, what they're, they're due in palliative care and, and know where to go for palliative care? Mr Forbes. I suppose in addition to the, the kind of public awareness campaigns that Mark was talking about, I suppose, uh, to, to answer Richard's point, I suppose uh, one way is to, I suppose, recognise the, um, and to get back to the person, I suppose, is the um, a massive isolation that everybody facing, um, you know, terminal illness must feel, um, even those with, with a huge amount of family support. And I suppose how we can get better at, uh, whether it's social work or health practitioners, I suppose, engaging with the community, um, I'm thinking of things like use of uh, social media. Um, I've come across a, a, I've got a relative who's terminally ill who's using a website called Caring Bridge, uh, which allows the individual to set up a blog so they can communicate with friends and family, people out in the internet, and it gives them back some control over their situation. Um, but, but also in Eastern Bartonshire, we're working with Macmillan on a, a community assets approach so that we've set up a website, we've got members of the public and service users to identify services and uh, that are useful or just community uh, facilities and, and they're all plotted on this website and people can uh, customise their own kind of support plan. Um, but also it's the aim of that is to work with people who are currently living with cancer or other long-term conditions, not just people at the end of life. So I suppose if we can build or help people to build up networks that are much uh, earlier stage by things things like peer support groups, uh, champions or whatever, um, and, and so that by the time they come to the end of life stage, I suppose they have a, a network of people who are going through similar uh, experiences to themselves uh, and, and they know where to go for advice and information. Mr Hazelwood and then um, Mr Mayor. 
Yeah, I, um, I just in response to your question, should I suppose when you made a will, you had an understanding of why that um, would be a useful and beneficial thing to do for your family and nearest and dearest, and you had information about how how to start the process of doing that, and you were able to overcome any of the barriers that there might have been for you to do that. You had opportunity to do it. And I think those are the things that we need to think about in terms of raising public awareness and getting more engagement in discussion. Um, so I think it's important to try and raise awareness of why it may be of benefit to people themselves and also their nearest and dearest to be a bit more open and to have some discussion and do some thinking and planning ahead whether that's making a will or a power of attorney or having a discussion with a GP about what, what preferences people might have for uh, medical stuff towards the end of life. Um, so there's an understanding of why it might be beneficial. People just need more information about what the practical choices and implications of different choices might be. Um, and I think then people need opportunities to have those discussions. And I, I referenced earlier about the fact that some GPs are very good about being able to initiate those sorts of conversations. I think the last thing I would say is that I, I think it probably come, becomes more difficult uh, as people become uh, sicker. So I think this is some, a process that should be started upstream. And I wanted to reference two practical examples of the sorts of ways we can go about shifting and changing culture in Scotland, I guess from each end of the sort of the life spectrum. The first is... Um, some work which we've linked up um, nearly a thousand organizations and individuals in an alliance called Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, which is about providing information, opportunities, shifting culture, and just normalizing these discussions and planning processes. And one of the organizations involved is Age Scotland, and they did a really nice partnership with a consortium of legal practices called Solicitors for Older People Scotland. Um, and they did. Um, they got a lawyer along to do some presentations and just to encourage some discussion about legal planning ahead at some of their lunch clubs across the south of Scotland. I think, yes, maybe there's an argument for sort of top-down public health uh, campaigns and stuff, but I think it's also really important that local organisations take a grassroots approach and they're more likely to know what's um, relevant and sensitive for their stakeholders. And I think that's really important because circumstances vary a great deal. And then I wanted to flag up some really good work um, which was done at by Strathcarran Hospice, but not in the hospice. They did some work looking at running workshops uh, with primary school teachers and with primary school kids in local schools. And I think to paraphrase their experience to start with, they found it quite difficult to get access into primary schools. I think schools were wary and scared of a sensitive subject. Um, but I think once they were able to start to work collaboratively with the local schools, <clears throat> that attitude changed enormously. And actually, they were invited in to work into other schools. And if you look at the statistics, for example, about the number of pupils within a, a school who are likely to have suffered a bereavement of some sort, it's a really high um, percentage. So the idea that if you don't do proactive work, to support children and staff to deal with issues of loss in schools. If you don't do that, you're in some way avoiding a harm because people will be upset if you do it. That's not the way to think about it. These issues of loss and bereavement and people nearing the end of life are impacting on uh, students in our schools and on, by implication on our staff. And we need to be making sure that these issues are there, that staff are supported and that the kids are encouraged and supported to... Um, talk about these things and I think probably the experience is that often uh, children and young people are much better and more open about talking these things than um, those of us towards the other end of the spectrum are. Yes, Mr Mayor, quickly we'll move to that. I appreciate that. I, I mean, I, I'm with Mark in this almost entirely. I think it's about encouraging the people, people to, to, to regain ownership of, of dying. I mean, I, when I was four or five, my auntie Gertie came to stay, and was for three or four months was in our front room and 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 died. I didn't know the scenario that 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 was the plan at the time, but 
it meant there was some first-hand experience of dying and somebody, it, 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 within, the fam, within family life and as, as part, a normal part of family life. I do think we have somewhat distanced ourselves from, f uh, you know, from that immediacy of ownership. Uh, of course, we need all the professional services where we represent the professional services. I'm not we're arguing against that. Uh, uh, but we actually have to allow people to feel ownership and control of, of, of that experience. Uh, and for it, it's not something that has to happen in a hospital, in a care home, you know, somewhere else, it is actually part of part, part of family, and I think there is an engagement of the of, of of the public to take place. Politicians have been pushed recently on whether they'd open uh, their house to refugees. Maybe we should ask politicians whether they would have somebody die in their home. Uh, I don't think you can if you... Can I thank... Uh, um, can I ask you, is palliative care readily available to all who require the service at this moment in time? I'm going to come back to the very first question that I was asked. We're speaking back to this horrible thing, definition. People think of palliative care as arising in the 60s with the hospice movement and cancer. No, it didn't. General practitioners have looked after people with palliative illnesses. They weren't called palliative illnesses because the word hadn't been invented. But by definition, general practitioners have looked after patients with incurable, life-threatening illnesses from the onset of the health service. So the answer to your question is, yes, palliative care is readily avail accessible. However, because everybody in, should be registered with a general practitioner and therefore have access to a primary care team. So that's the theoretical answer. What I cannot say, however, is what is the quality of that care what are the additional components that would support the person, their availability? I don't know. That could be variable across the country. I think the bigger question is how available is specialist palliative care to everyone who does not have a cancer diagnosis? Malcolm Chisholm. Um, thanks very much for your oral and written evidence, but if I can just pick out in particular grasping the nettle, uh, no disrespect to the other submissions, but that's obviously a, a long submission which I hope the government will pay attention to and just ask a couple of questions related to that. One about health and social care partnerships because all the relevant players are sitting there uh, today and there's quite a lot of interesting recommendations. I don't think I've got time to read them all out, but things like an identity, identified lead for palliative and end-of-life care, make sure you include it in your strategic and operational plans, and so on. It's recommend uh, action points 8 to 13 in the uh, Grasping the Nettle report. So I suppose my question is, uh, to what extent do you agree with the recommendations, but I suppose more practically and more immediately, to what extent is this being discussed because you're setting these up at this very moment uh, and they're going live in a few months' time. So to what extent are these issues being taken on board currently as we set up uh, the partnerships, because clearly uh, that's going to be one of the responsibilities of uh, the health and social care partnerships. I think there is active discussion at the local level. There, there are some continuing concerns that not all the new partnerships have fully engaged both the third sector and the independent sector, so there are there are there are there's varying experience of to what extent there is full inclusion uh, of all social care provision within the within the the work that goes on. However, I think I think people do continue to see palliative and end of life care as an area where 
in, in a sense, it's, it's the wrong way for us, given what we've been talking about, but where there are some gains to be made in terms of shifting the balance of care, <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, I think it is still seen as an area where if we could promote the care both in the community and in homely, uh, homely settings, uh, care homes and hospices, uh, there are actually gains in terms of easing some of the pressure on the, on the, on the acute sector. Uh, uh, the harder part, because the mechanisms aren't fully there, even within pooled budgets, the mechanisms aren't fully there in terms of getting the corresponding shift in resource that's, that, that's required. So you can have people saying strategically, uh, in terms of the strategic plan, this is the direction we would like to see, but actually getting the resource shift to happen at the same time is, is, is more problematic. Yeah, I mean, I'd, again, I'd, I'd like to agree with much of what, what Ronald has been saying. I mean, in a sense, the, the purpose of health and social and health and social care integration is is to grasp the nettle of, of shifting the balance of care. Um, now, recognising that means a much broader range of things than, than what we've been focused on today, but um, palliative care and supporting people who wish to die at home or in a homely setting is, is very much part of the shifting the balance of care discussion that, that partnerships are having right now. Dr Carroll. Just to say that in NHS Grampian we had our original meeting um, a number of weeks ago with all the relevant uh, parties. Uh, as a result of that meeting we have identified uh, priorities that we need to look at and there will be a series of subsequent meetings again with health and social care and third sector to um, pull everything together so it's ready for May, April. Okay, well, well, I think those were in, an interesting recommendations uh, from the report. Just one other brief question on the report which again it was interesting uh, Ranald Mayer referred to rights based approaches in the new care standards and obviously they've been more widely talked about and indeed uh, legislated for um, quite recently but um, again Grasp the Nettle says rights based approaches can be helpful in raising public awareness and understanding of what people can expect to receive but framing policy in terms of people's needs and the outcomes we want to see as an alternative way of providing clarity about what people should be able to expect. So I just wondered, um, I suppose it's to Mark Hazelwood really what, uh, what the report had in mind. It, it, it might almost be seen as a criticism of rights-based approaches, but perhaps that's not what's intended. I, I suppose in pulling the report together, we're mindful that in many policy areas now there is an increased emphasis on rights-based approaches. And I suppose what we are just flagging up in that paragraph is that... Um, Yep, there are there are positive, positive um, aspects of a rights-based approach. But I'm just conscious of the discussions that we've been having <coughs> about the need for a wider public dialogue about the resourcing, particularly around our social care um, services. And um, I, 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 I think, I think it was Jeremy Bentham who said that. Um, rights were nonsense on stilts. I'm not wishing to subscribe to that view, but I think we have to be careful about, it's quite easy to ascribe people a right to have really excellent power to an end of life care. Um, and I don't think, I think we have to be cautious in doing that without having the um, serious and important discussions about the economic resources required to deliver that. Nonsense and stilts. I think that might be circulating somewhere soon. <laughs> okay, two other people. Mr. Yeah. Thompson, I mean, just, just a, a sort of um, end to that, I suppose, in, in that, in the way, in the same way as we're moving from a sort of, you know, medicalised uh, approach to one that's much more reflective of of uh, the wider holistic needs of people and <laughs> the need to involve social work social care and voluntary agencies, I suppose maybe the next stage is uh, more about empowering the individual and putting the person at the centre. And I mentioned earlier about the use of self-directed support, which I think uh, is confined to social care at the moment, but could be looked at within a health context as well, I suppose, about helping people to, to self-manage. Uh, which I know is, is a, a big thrust for you know the, the big voluntary uh, agencies in in, in this area, um, and, and I suppose just allowing people to get control, 
um, you know, I mentioned social media, um, but but also the, the feeling that they um, they have a say in um, uh, how they uh, put together their care and support, and um, who comes in and what they do to them. At a meeting of the Scottish Older People's Assembly, uh, and was challenged on the use of the term outcomes. Uh, they were uh, saying that they felt this was a term that had come increasingly into use, and but was fundamentally vague. Uh, they, they, because they felt it was neither clear what was an entitlement uh, or what was an aspiration. It combined elements of both. Uh, and they felt that we should be clear at any point in time, what is my entitlement? What have I got a right to expect from what are your aspirations for me? Not that both aren't, e aren't equally important, but we should at least be clear and we shouldn't roll them up into a term which actually then conveys a, a sense of vagueness about, uh, about what is being committed. Um, uh, so I suppose for, for me, in terms of palliative and end of life care, we should try and be clear. What have people got a, a right to expect at any point in time? Uh, but equally, what are our aspirations? for a, a end of life uh, and, a, and uh, you know, our, that dying well is, combines elements of both of those things, entitlements and our aspiration for people. Walter. Carl. Um, I, I'm <coughs> very happy with the concept of self-care, uh, self-management, uh, but I'm going to go back to those figures that I gave you from NHS Grampian. 70% of the population died at the age of over 75. So their ability to self-manage as their illness is unfolding is dropping all the time. And then it becomes a nonsense to suspect or suggest that they self-manage. And I, I, I often wonder, I get uncomfortable when, when it's always there on that triangle with specialist services at the bottom self-management at, at, uh, at the top, sorry, self-management at the bottom. Yes, self-management is important, but it's not going to continue all the way through that illness. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, Bob Doris. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, I know time's almost upon us. I'll, 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 I'll try, try, try and be brief. I, I kind of want to focus on the, the care home sector a little bit, but before I do that, could I maybe just read something from Grasping the Nettle uh, in the executive summary? Where it says, people, uh, the strategic framework for action, people receive health and social care which supports their well-being, irrespective of their diagnosis, age, socio-economic background, care setting, or proximity to death. Each individual care may look very different. And I'm trying to how, how that how you can bring that to life, if you like, in a in a social in a social care setting. I, I, I suspect there is. Um, quality palliative care taking place in social care settings every day of the week. They might not call it palliative care because what they do is care. Um, but given the various complex needs and competing needs that there are in the social care sector and the residential setting, I'm not talking about nursing care, I'm talking about the various needs in, in the kind of, if you like, general uh, residential sector uh, for older people. I'm, I'm just wondering, first of all, do we, do we document anywhere what we actually do well? Because there is good work going on um, and that would be palliative care or do we tend to just like we go that's the last year of life something clicks in that's a tick box right let's document what palliative care services look like and are we missing a, a trick there but I suppose the substantive question or something I'd like to reflect on is um, do, do, in terms of aspect as Mr Mayor mentioned aspirations in relation to palliative care the, irrespective of resource issues irrespective of staffing issues um, is there a period of comp a contemplation, if you like, that uh, residential um, care homes may go through and say, well, if we could do more, what is it we would like to do? You know, whether it's hoisting someone into a bath twice a week rather than once a week, because that gives a therapeutic benefit to that individual. Is it maybe allied health professionals who used to come out when they were at home but tends not to come into it because it's once you're in the residential care setting things change a little bit. So I'm just wondering, are we documenting what we're actually doing well to a degree in the care home setting, but are we doing that aspiration thing, or are we just a little bit scared about the resource issues? Okay. No, you, you answer the 
question because I cannot answer the question. Okay. But I wanted to say what I'm going to say before Ranald answered okay. it. I'm delighted you've asked that question because all the time we've been here, we have been essentially speaking about illness, deterioration, and dying. Palliative care is also about living. And we, for sometimes I think, forget that people are actually living during their palliative illness. And that part of the care that we should be trying to offer, both particularly social, but also from medical, is to maximize their quality of life. Let's hit as many bucket lists as we can for these people. So that's all I wanted to say, because that's the essence of what you've, you've asked. And I'm pleased you've asked it. Yeah. Like, likewise, certainly, it's a, it's a kind of key question. On, on the one hand, I think, if I'm being honest, there has been a danger of a one-size-fits-all approach to care of older people in, in care homes. There has been insufficient diversification of styles and uh, models of care within that, and I think there needs to be more. And there has to be much greater emphasis on person-centeredness so that the individual, one individual's plan <laughs> needs to look quite differently from somebody else's. We have the building blocks of that, but we've not gone the whole way. Even the, the government stopped short with self-directed support of saying it didn't fully apply to residential care. There are some pilots taking place at the moment to test out to what extent it could self-directed support could fit with our model of residential care. So we actually have to, to be aspirational uh, in how we move this forward to say that all, not all care homes should look the same. Uh, there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach. There should be very individualised care plans and pathways. And that should include, uh, 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 you know, the discussions with people in, in terms of anticipatory care planning, not just in terms of what they want the end to look like, but actually what they want the bit before the end to look like. That's the more important bit. I agree with uh, 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 you, you know, David on that point. I mean, that, that actually a lot of people who go into care homes, some people who have been told or the families have been told that they may only have a few weeks actually <laughs> do make some element of recovery and have more time. Important that that time is spent, not just waiting for the end, uh, but actually time that's spent to add, add quality. Mr Forms. Um, part of our, that Ronald's talking about, about keeping the person at the centre for as long as possible and responding to Dr Carroll's point about the fact that people inevitably deteriorate and maybe are less able to be actively involved, is things like anticipatory care plans which don't just focus on medical aspects and treatment and withdrawal of medical support but, but very much focus on people's social, psychological lives. Um, also the use of advocacy, um, advocacy organisations who can continue to speak for people uh, even if they uh, lose capacity and we mentioned earlier about encouraging as many people as possible to do, take our power of attorney to encourage people to become guardians if people lose capacity so there's a number of ways we can we can retain the person at the centre uh, beyond their ability to actively uh, do that for themselves. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I thank you very much for uh, your attendance and your participation and asking all of our questions and um, uh, are answering all of the questions and giving lo lots of uh, food for thought this morning. Thank you all very much for being with us this morning. Um, we'll pause at this point and as we turn around uh, our, our, and take our next witness panel, thank you very much.
Right, we'll, we'll continue um, our, our, our evidence for our, our palliative care inquiry, um, which is the second panel and the last day of evidence. Uh, and can I welcome uh, to the committee um, Ms Sandra Campbell, uh, Macmillan Nurse Consultant for Cancer and Palliative Care, Royal College of Nursing. Um, also Dr Ewan Patterson, uh, Royal College of General Practitioners, Scotland. Maggie Grundy, Associate Director, Nursing and Midwifery, NHS Education for Scotland. And Professor Rob George, President of Association for Palliative Medicine of Great Britain and Ireland, Medical Director of St Christopher's Hospice Association of Palliative Medicine. Welcome to you all. And we'll in the interest of time, we'll go directly to questions, and the first question is from Malcolm Chisholm. If I could ask a question about recording systems, I think this was something we didn't really cover in the first panel, but you're all ideally suited to answer it. Um, I suppose I suppose the first issue that, that it is really, particularly I suppose to the Royal College of GPs, is, is about the palliative care register, because we've heard from various people that there's a problem about identifying people, so I suppose uh, there is a question there about how well GPs record those who would benefit from uh, palliative and end-of-life care. But if I'll just roll up, since we're a bit short of time, I'll roll up uh, my whole question into one, because the other uh, recording systems that we read about in the evidence and so on is the emergency care summary, the electronic uh, palliative care summary, the key information system and the anticipatory care plan. So, ob and obviously there's a, just an issue about clarity around how, how all those systems uh, relate to each other and when they're put in acronyms, of course, it sometimes gets even more confusing. But I, I suppose it would, it would be helpful if we could have some clarity around those, uh, the relationship between those uh, without labouring the point. I suppose also improvements that could be made to make those systems work better. So I'm sorry, that, that's rather a lot of issues in one question, but it, 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 it's really saying something about the registers, particularly from the Royal College of GPs, but broadening it out to those other recording systems uh, for everybody else. Um, is, that, is that on? Yes, I can. Yes. We're hitting yes. them yes. on. Yes. Right. Okay, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, lots of different things there. Uh, the Palliative Care Register, probably there for me, the biggest issue as a GP is, it's back to this awkward thing, where I came in for your previous discussion about how you define this stage. And I think that's an extremely awkward issue. Um, how do you decide if somebody should be on your part of care register? Um, I, I think one of the problems is that we, we struggle to really come up with a working definition of what palliative care is and who it is for. And if you can't do that, it's really very difficult to work around the edges of that. For me, I guess it's... There's, there's little, if any... Well, there's very little that would separate my mind good care from just from palliative care. Palliative care is just good care for people who happen to be dying. And I would argue that the, the, the dying side of that is when that individual's death becomes relevant to that individual. And that's the real crux of this. Um, and that's a very personal matter for individual people. So some people will embrace the idea that they are actually dying at a much earlier stage than others. I've looked after somebody recently with motor neuron disease, who was incredibly reluctant to accept the fact that death was actually inevitable. Uh, that was how he dealt with it. Um, I think sometimes for us it's our role as healthcare professionals to try and explore with people the fact that we believe that they are now at a stage where they should be considering the imminence, for whatever, however we define imminence, of their own mortality, but they may be reluctant to do so themselves. It's a very complex area. If we can deal with that, then it becomes easier to, to put people in the palliative care register. Um, historically, and although we've been keeping registers now for oh, five, six years maybe, the proportion is still heavily weighted towards people with a cancer diagnosis. I would contest that that's because people with a cancer diagnosis are far more likely to be willing to be considered as palliative. And that then takes to some of the points that Mark was making particularly about good life, good death, good grief. If there's one big hit here, it would be to get the population on board with the fact that you're born you live and you die, and it's an uncomfortable reality, but let's make the best of it. Um, and I, I think that's, that's, that would be my one big issue with that. Moving on from that, and I could talk for 45 minutes in the Pathway Register, so I will move on. Um, the various different systems that we've got, the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the emergency care summary is just an upload of some key demographic stuff, your drugs and allergies from GP systems. So fundamentally, all these things have been lifted from general practice systems. It's only what we put in. It's ours. It's our records that you are accessing, that other people are accessing. And we need to be mindful of that before we think that it's something far more than it actually is. So the ECS is, is for everybody. Everybody's more or less given uh, informed consent. I will use inverted commas around the words informed for that one because I suspect most people don't know they've done it. Um, the, the electronic part of care summary is probably lapsing now. It really has been taken over by the key information summary. The key information summary, that I, I would just focus on that one. Um, it, it is attached to the ECS, so it gets uploaded out of our records along with that and carries far more information. It's got five separate sort of subheadings, one of which is palliative care, and you could argue that if people are, if you're adding data on the palliative care section, then maybe you're beginning to think that the, the person's mortality has become relevant. But not forgetting that the key information summary is used for far more than just people who are dying. So it could be used for anybody with any significant condition whatsoever. Um, and again, but it is reliant on the information that we as GPs will input into that, because currently, more or less, GPs are the only people who have what I would call right access to this. Uh, it, it, there's lots of people who have got read access, but we're the only people writing into it. Does that help? Thank you, Professor uh, uh, George. Thank you very much. Um, the, the two points, I guess, that would be important. The first is that, uh, and I suppose just to come clean on what I think palliative care is, I think palliative care is looking after people rather than their pathologies. Um, and I think it's engaging uncertainty, I think it's engaging suffering, and I think it's engaging complexity. And so, as Ewan said, that runs through the thread of everybody's life, and there are certain points at which this comes in, and it becomes more pressing as death starts to come up on the horizon. And that may happen intermittently, particularly with the longer-term conditions or frailty or multiple comorbidities, what I would sometimes call practicing dying. My mother does it about every six months and has been doing for the last five years. Um, managing those difficulties are, are very real. And the only way, really, that I think the complexity of the healthcare system and the social care system can keep on top of this now is by making sure that the systems that we record in talk to each other. And so having portals and all those kinds of things in there. And we engage this whole question of whether we had a palliative care register or whatever in London by calling it Coordinate My Care. Because actually when it became relevant was when there was the need for coordination and for people to be able to manage the uncertainty when somebody might suddenly be coming into hospital or might have a particular view about what they did or didn't want to happen in their care and that the ambulance crews or whoever saw it didn't do what they, that person didn't want. So in a sense, it was specifying more what the limits and refusals were that a person had uh, in, in their own particular radar. And <clears throat> uh, certainly in the institution I work at the moment, uh, we are looking now to joining our own hospice-based electronic system to the primary care system, which is the main one that's in South London. So we will effectively be doing what Ewan has said, which is we're docking in to what is essentially the primary responsible clinician's patient's care, and that's the general practitioner. So to my mind, it all has to focus in on the primary care record, um, and we may or may not have right rights. We certainly should have read rights. And of course, the day will come in the not too distant future where people themselves will have a determination over who reads their records, because actually a person's records belong to them uh, as well. And so um, we're looking, for example, at, uh, uh, at uh, people having uh, tablets where they, are, they have the access to their own clinical records as well and can contribute to those. And of course, the advantage at the moment is that there is sufficiently rapid growth in the electronic world uh, particularly uh, in, in, uh, on, on the web platforms, that, that it is within our reach for people to have multiple access points and to be able to dock into portals and suck data down and put data up into various places. All, all the security issues and so on apply, but you know we seem to do it with money, so why can't we do it with healthcare? Um, I think that, that if there were one thing that we really had to pay attention to, it was this ability to read what everybody else is doing and doing it in real time. 
and and ambulance crews when a call goes out to know that within three to five minutes they have a care record on in their ambulance which says what this person is likely to be facing and in particular what they do or don't want to be done really makes joint decision making and personalized care real anyone else on that one no well that was a very useful recommendation and should that should that apply to the anticipatory care plan as well? It would sound as if that was relevant. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, I, I, another definition for palliative care is it's, it's anticipatory planning in real time yeah. because we spend our whole time uh, re revisiting yeah. people's priorities. Every time there's a clinical intervention, every time there's a task met, yeah. then there's another piece of anticipation that has to apply. So in a sense, palliative care is anticipatory planning in real time. But just a final point to Dr. Passon. I mean, do you think that given that while recognising the needs of cancer patients and they're not all met, th there is a particular issue with those who have other conditions. I mean, should GPs be making more effort to ensure that their registers encompass the full range of people who might benefit from palliative and end-of-life care? Uh, yes. Um, should GPs be making more effort? Um, I'm sure we should be making more effort in lots of things. I mean, I, mean, I suppose that's another issue, which is com competing priorities. Uh, and one of the things that has surfaced before is the issue of resource and so on. And let's be very mindful of the fact that currently general practice resource is in pretty short supply and getting shorter. Uh, so there is an issue of workload and workforce that needs to be recognised. I'm quite sure you'll have seen the thing from the from the RCGP. Um, I think it's we're back to the to really start to identify other people that are, are more of the other groups of people with long term conditions or old age frailty decline to kind of put it all into one sort of subheading. We really need, the, I think, the societal buy-in to accept that these are that these are big deals, that these are big issues. The the, the things that get in the road probably are <coughs> patient awareness, person awareness of the enormity of what they are facing, and then acceptance of the enormity of what they're facing. If I give somebody a diagnosis of cancer or confirm the diagnosis of how it usually is, they kind of start right down at the bottom and then hope they come back up a bit as they realise that other things can be done. But if I say to somebody, my goodness, you know, this is actually, it's your, your breathlessness is because of heart failure, they're likely to say, oh, goodness, thank, oh, I thought it might be cancer. What a relief. And it's actually quite difficult then to, to you have to unpick that. And, and, and as, as Rob said, the, the, the uncertainty that is inherent in long-term conditions and old age frailty, decline, dementia, makes the, the management of somebody very, very, very difficult indeed. And they can flip between, oh, last hours of life to, oh, months, if not more of life, uh, almost in the, in, in the blink of an eye. So it is, it, and, and people may not be, I mean, you know, we, we use the surprise question to try and populate registers. Would you be surprised if this person is to die in the next year? I've got a 94-year-old mother. Would I be surprised if my 94-year-old mother was to die in the next year? No, because 94-year-olds die. Would I be surprised if she didn't die in the next year? No, I would not be surprised. The lady is still buying her sherry by the case. You know, she's doing well. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, but it, 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 she would love to be in somebody's supportive care register, but I would get a flea in me if I put her in a palliative care register. OK, thanks. That's very helpful. You, you know, just getting back to that definition, we've had some discussion about the previous panel as well. I suppose the, the discussion round about the definition, that does it trigger certain actions or elements of support? So the definition does become important if it's described or uh, you know within the new palliative care strategy because it can lead to a referral to additional support or not in, in some cases whether those people want to be on that on that panel or not and it can be a gateway it could become a gateway to access so it becomes important in itself maybe bureaucratic you know but it doesn't take account of those those differences in human beings and how they face life-threatening situations, a life-changing situation. Yes, uh, but I think I think the people that we are caring for, the people we are serving, are facing enormity all the time, not just about whether or not they're dying. So it's it's, it's an enormous big deal. There's a, a tremendous lot of human suffering out there which we are dealing with or trying to deal with and help with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for me, the the there are really only two things in my mind that separate out palliative <coughs> care from good care. One is the fact that it is an enormous deal because you only do it once. 
And I'm not being flippant at all about that. That's how we navigate our lives through the important events. And one of these is death, death of loved ones. So that's important. And that separates it from the care of somebody who's anxious, say. But apart from that, the only thing in my mind that really separates out is the fact that, and again, the, the previous panel touched on this, is that as one fails, the ceilings of what one is being offered, of what is appropriate, begin to lower. So one moves away from being a transplant candidate, one moves away from being an HDU admission candidate, one moves away from being a CPR candidate, and so on and so forth, until finally you're down to one will move away from being a, an oral antibiotic candidate towards the end of life. So it, it is this gradual lowering of the ceilings of treatment or intervention that I would contest is the only thing that separates out, apart from the enormity, from just good care. I spoke to last week at our evidence, you know, the access to some of these things was at a crisis point rather than earlier. They, they say, I wish that some of this support earlier. It was at, at that crisis point when it kicks in and then suddenly you've got you, you've got this, all of the interventions, and you know, cost doesn't matter, you know, uh, all of the interventions, you know, squeezed into that last couple of weeks or months, you know. But is that not because we are encouraging people still to put in the separation between care and palliative care? And so until you reach that bridge, you don't get it, rather than just needs-based care, which is what we really should be talking about. I think, again, Rob talked about two minutes ago. Yeah, but some of, the, some of those people were saying that they, they, they felt they were passed, being passed along. They, they had a lot of faith in their GP, and, you know, before you know, that happened, then they were passed on to the consultant, and they passed along until, the, you know, that day, we, we, we can't do anything more for you, go, you know, and you're passed on again. You know, so they had been through the process, the, the people we spoke to last week, and, uh, and while they, they, they were cared for by their GP and then the consultant and then the radium and, whatever, you know, and, and cancer patients right along that line, they felt as if they were being sort of passed pass, pass along within that context. They, their, their wider, um, their wider uh, needs or support was not made available until they found their way normally. Well, last week you know, it was... Uh, word of mouth that found them, uh, a, a, a specialist uh, hospice serv services. Mr. Yeah. Uh, professor, yes. of course, I'll let anyone uh, else who was one, one of, I, I mean, that's, this is a really important point, and I think that, that and uh, listening to the previous evidence and also reading some of the evidence, that we, we are at a, a t tipping point in society, I think. I think society has to ch change the way it sees care, the way it sees mortality, the way it sees responsibilities that we have one to another, so on and so forth. And within that as well is, is, is the role of this peculiar thing that's been come called palliative care. And you know, in a sense, it's an existential crisis that we have to define who we are in order to know who we are. And then it just becomes a problem. The fact of the matter is that there are certain expertises that I have that, that are useful at various points in a clinical journey, which may be applicable. Um, and what's really interesting is that there's, there's some recent studies, which you may have heard of already, uh, of early involvement for palliative care, early referral to palliative care um, in uh, lung cancer, and it's also in a number of other diseases now, where not only do patients get better experience, they live longer. And that primarily is because they're getting choices. We're probably not poisoning them. And, and actually, they are living a life rather than dying a death. And this idea of being passed along like a place of cakes until there are just a few crumbs left, and that then becomes palliative care, I think has got to stop. I think we've got to see helping people to complete lives, helping people to live lives until they die, and the practicalities that go along there. And, of course, just going back to the electronic registers, let's say for the sake of argument, Ewan had a problem with a patient, and he referred that person to me, and I happened to be the, the clinician involved, I can see that data from, the prim from his own primary care record, and actually I can contribute into that or not contribute into that. So it stops becoming, oh, they're on the register, to be, oh, this person needs to be seen over here, but this is their body of electronic record or, or, or the data that's gone on. So it's starting to break those barriers down, to have a much more fluid way of doing things, working across disciplines, between health and social care, and within communities. And I think that's the direction of travel that we need to be looking at. It's, it is really quite radical, I feel. I'm conscious that Sandra and Maggie haven't come in here, you know, so, Sandra? I, I think um, 
the core of what we're discussing here is about communication, actually. And it's not just communication with patients and families, it's communication between teams. Um, but the very important thing I think that we miss sometimes is the conversation happens, that, that very sensitive conversation around what is actually happening, what we expect to happen or anticipate might happen with that individual and their family happens a step too late. Sometimes we need to be able to have that conversation perhaps a bit sooner on the journey, which would avoid people feeling they're passed from pillar to post. I accept that there are certain investigations and certain stages people need to be through, go through, but we need to have honest communication along the way with those, with those individuals. And we need to introduce the concept of thinking ahead or advanced care planning, anticipated care planning, perhaps a bit sooner than sometimes is the case for, for individuals. And I think if we can do that, now it's not the be all and end all, but it certainly would help to um, enable teams put things in place perhaps a bit sooner, but also allow, along with the dying is the living. And people in society, we have, you know, our, our older people now have fewer, there are younger less children, should we say, families are smaller, there are fewer carers available to be able to look after our um, family members as they are on a, on a declining uh, trajectory. Uh, so we need more time, we need to be able to have the conversations and allow people to be able to plan in a safe and effective way so that people get the best outcome. And it is important to discuss <coughs> outcomes as well, because what we want for everyone is that ability to live as well as possible for as long as possible and be able to achieve what they want to achieve. If we don't have those conversations early on enough in that journey where it's possible to do so, then we deprive the individual and their family of that ability to be able to fulfil whatever it is they may, they, they wish, they, they may wish to, um, to achieve in that time. One of the speakers earlier alluded to or brought in the conversation around um, a, um, the funding, you know, the, the, the self-directed payments or supported payments, etc. That is all very well when there is enough time to plan around that. But unfortunately, in many cases, the patients and families who have life-limiting life -limiting conditions, there is not the time to have those conversations. So it's, 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 a, it's a balance, actually, about how we provide that support and provide the appropriate funding and resource for each individual case and really get person-centred care on the map and not just care package or a typical care package. Each individual will have different needs and the only way we will be able to ascertain what these needs are is by a complete holistic assessment at appropriate stages on the journey with appropriately trained individuals, be that health or social care. So I've waffled on a bit, I'll, I'll stop there. But the key message is around communication. Dr. Patterson, did you want to come in on this point? Or, um, yes. Or oh, well, Maggie's going to come in? I would, I would, I would agree with Sandra. Actually, it is all about communications, but I think there's a wider systems issue as well, and it is about the communications between professionals. But there's a percep the perception of palliative care is not understood by all, and people will need different levels of palliative care throughout their throughout their illness and towards their death, and they may not need they will may need more or lesser support depending on where they are. But we do need to focus on that holistic assessment and what the person's needs are at that particular time. I think rather than actually getting involved in registers and who's on the register and whether that actually is the entrance to palliative care, there is something just about not getting focused too much on one thing and how we help the system to join up and actually speak to each other. Dr Patterson? Yeah, um, I suppose really just reiterating and commenting on both these my colleagues' comments there is that it's back to the, what what people what people perceive about palliative care. Um, I, I still struggle slightly. I think that we're and David was talking about it earlier, but the fact that actually it's just good care. People should be involved in the decisions about their health, irrespective of whether they're dying or not. The sort of care that I give somebody who's depressed or who's got asthma is the same as the sort of care I give to somebody who's dying. Except the person who's dying, there's a couple of things like CPR say that they maybe not. Are going to be offered, but they should still be being supported and um, be. I mean, I suppose be this idea. One of the things and it didn't surface before, and I suppose it's just I'm bouncing into one of my great concerns, which is that we're talking a lot about what we do to and for people, but I think there is a huge amount of what we do just simply by being with people when they are ill, and I think a, a large chunk of my job not just in palliative care, but in care full stop, is a, a term lifted from my own Heath, a GP in London, who she, she talks about a role of witnessing people's suffering, and that is critically important when people are dying. 
and you just be with them, not doing anything to them or for them, but just being with them. Or in the case of my last MND man who died, who I have his permission, his family's used the story, as, as, we, as, I, as I was with him, I was helping him smoke because he couldn't do it for himself anymore. And that's about being with somebody at the end of their life. And I think we shouldn't ignore these and all these kind of systems things. Rhoda Grant. Um, can I probably move on a bit from that? <clears throat> the first panel, and indeed yourselves, have mentioned you know, where this care takes place. And what's quite clear is it takes place in normal care settings at home in the community. So I was keen to ask about training, because that seems to be, and again, Sandra Campbell said, you know, a suitably trained professional. Um, a lot of the people carrying out that care won't be suitably trained because they won't be specialists in the area. There'll be generalists who are supporting people at home or in the community or whatever. How do we make sure that the people doing that are, are properly equipped with the skills and knowledge to allow them to do it? Because some people will be reluctant to raise issues, not sure how the patient's going to react. How do we make sure that people feel confident in that situation and are able to give um, the support they need to give to people in that situation? It is an issue, and we know that communication comes up all the time as one of the areas that's not done well. We've had lots of initiatives in terms of communication skills training over the years. It is incorporated into undergraduate education for healthcare professionals, and a lot of effort has gone in in recent years into improving that. Um, one of the things we perhaps don't do as well is in terms of people who are already working in the system and qualified professionals who perhaps maybe haven't had the same input into the communication skills at an early stage in their education. And I think often our reaction is, let's put everything into undergraduate pre-registration education. Um, but if people actually get into the system, they can be very quickly socialised if what they learn in practice isn't actually part of the system and isn't actually used in the system. Um, we did a, a literature review um, a few years ago looking at what the barriers were to using communication skills when people had actually been on training. Um, and one of the issues was the ability not to be able to apply it and not be able to practice when they get into practice. So in terms of communication skills and helping people who are not specialists and are generalists, it is about how we actually help people to build their confidence, their competence, and actually have that ability to be able to use their skills in practice. Um, and that is something that is quite intensive in terms of training. It can be done, but it would need. To, it, it is about how we facilitate that in practice. Um, we have got various. We have got various sort of tutor training courses for facilitators for communication that could be employed on a on a wider basis. We have lots of pockets of good practice, but they're not consistent across the country. So it is about thinking a little bit more creatively, perhaps, about how we can make communication more applicable in practice and help people to use those skills. Anyone else? I would support um, that. And, and there, sorry, that no. there absolutely needs to be, it's about levels of, um, of education and levels of knowledge and a consistency to that as well. So whether it's health or social care, for example, um, you know, very often it is, you know, it will be unqualified staff who are on the on the front line, if you like, managing patients at the very end of life who may be asked very, very difficult questions and put in very, very difficult sets of circumstances and may feel really ill-equipped. And that is not, that's not good for the patient, obviously, or the family, but it's certainly not good for the, for the staff member either. So how do we ensure that we can have a consistent approach across health and social care for that group of, you know, for, and a certain level of knowledge and, and, and training for that level, and then more advanced communication skills for the very complex decisions, for example, around perhaps do you have a peg inserted or not etc a, a, a tube feed for example so so there are different levels I've given two different examples there and um, there are different levels and I think we need to have a consistent approach Scotland across Scotland there are as Maggie said pockets of different models of education that different boards adopt and use but a consistent approach would be um, would be helpful and beneficial <coughs> yeah um, I think I mean, I, I'll just stick I guess with general practice because it's the only group that I'm really in any way qualified to talk 
vaguely for even. Um, I think some of it is communication skills. I accept that. But I'm, I'm unconvinced that that really is the answer, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. there, there won't be a GP under the age of probably now of about 52, 53 who hasn't undergone extensive communication skills training. It's part of what, when I used to do GP training, I stopped for 10 years, but it, I would probably spend about two or three hours every fortnight with my trainee for a year on communication skills. Now that is a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So there won't be a single person in this room, sadly, who's not had a bad encounter with a GP. Yeah, everybody's in that boat. No, you've all had good encounters. Fantastic. I, 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 t I, t I mean, I, I'm conscious. I mean, I, I think most people, most audiences would disagree with that. Would, would be on my side with that one. But it's not that GPs lack communication skills. It's for whatever reason we're not using them. And why might that be? I think there's several reasons for that. One, I think, is this pure attitudinal stuff. I would love to think that. The, the, the level of care afforded to the, the retired GP at 69 who's dying of metastatic breast cancer is exactly the same as for the 45-year-old heroin addict who is dying of hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis. But I suspect it's not. I suspect it's not. And I think the other thing is the systems that we then expect people to work within. If you put people in a system where the environment is such that they are struggling to do the tasks that they have to do, um, then compassion can get leached out. And we've, there's all this stuff from down south in England where we don't need to go into that, but that's what can happen. I'm conscious even, I mean, I, I, I love communication. I, I love working with my patients. I love trying to support people. But I know that I will enter every surgery and most consultations unable to meet the demands of the people I'm trying to serve because of time limitation. Um, it's the same whether it's not just the microwave that pings, it's the wee clock that goes round in front of me in the surgery. But the patient can't see, I hasten to add. It's in my field of view, but not theirs. But I know that the time is, is limited. And, and that affects the compassion of the care that we can deliver. And that can then sap the morale of the healthcare providers. Because if you know you're not doing it as well as you can do it, it's not a good place to be. Yes, I just really wanted to support that. And, and that is, on the one hand, um, our task is witness, primarily. Um, and what comes with witness is a burden. So burden of witness is a very significant morbidity in healthcare professionals, particularly in dealing with these difficult areas. And if we don't take account of that, then we develop compassion fatigue. And if, if we are driven by outcomes that are not patient-related um, and don't take notice of keeping us fit and healthy within the task that we do, then we start to malfunction. And what happens normally with burnout is the first stage is you start to disengage. Necessarily, you distance yourself from individuals for no other reason than to protect yourself. There are not mechanisms in place to support that mm. and provide the debriefing. And those of us who are in specialist practice, we have clinical supervision as a matter of course. Um, that's really important. I mean, in terms of time, it's depth of time and not length of time that matters. So you can, if you are very skilled, um, have an interaction of five or ten minutes that will be more significant than an hour or two by somebody who is not skilled. So skill is important, but actually it is keeping fitness and health within the workforce in order to do the job well, because we will do it more efficiently, more effectively, and probably more quickly, because we're not frightened to engage the question rather than worrying about protecting ourselves in the process because we're so exhausted. Mike McKenzie, are you finished, Rhoda? Are you got one, one more? <coughs> Entry to that, because from what I'm hearing, and I, I'm not sure I've picked this right up right, is the training is there, everyone is trained, all the generalists are trained. What is missing is the time and space to have those mo maybe more difficult conversations with people. Sam, and, and also, the, I mean, a lot of the work that I do is debriefing with colleagues from difficult deaths or difficult interventions or helping with a complex family. So one of the clinical interventions I may be involved in is facilitating a very complex family interaction where there's a breakdown of relationship, for example, with the, within the healthcare setup or the social care setup or within the family itself. So there are those types of roles as well. Yeah, I think there is education and there is training available. Who takes it up isn't already known, and the impact of all the training isn't known. What's not so clear 
is how people use those skills in practice once they've had training. And for me, that's the bit that needs the support, is how we support people to change the computer program, if you like, because we are all programmed to say certain things at certain times. And if you want people to have real conversations, in-depth conversations, sensitive conversations, then people need to be able to know when to use the right questions, the right conversations at the right time. And it's the support to be able to do that in practice and build up the confidence, because it's only with practice that people actually develop those skills. And that's the bit that we perhaps need to focus on more now. Sandra, did you want to add? Yeah, surely, surely, yeah. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around training, around communication skills, but there's, obvious, there's also a lack of awareness, of access to education around general palliative care as well. Um, so in specialist centres, people will be uh, highly trained, but actually the vast majority of palliative and end-of-life care is delivered out there in the community or in the hospital by staff who unfortunately perhaps have not had access to, um, to education. And um, that's not a criticism, that's the reality, and we need to be able to put programmes in place for existing staff to be able to give them the support to deliver excellent care. OK. Mike McKenzie. Uh, thank you, convener. I was just uh, wanted to explore... Um, what uh, Dr Patterson and Professor George had been just, I think, touching on, and it's about the, the pressure that the medical professions generally are under. And I just wonder how much of that has been created by a kind of false public expectation that we all are going to enjoy perfect health throughout the entirety of our life and that we're a bit like cars there's a perfect solution for every problem. And furthermore, that, that that extends into palliative care, that somehow there's a notion that it's a kind of gold standard, um, that if you can get through the gate mark palliative care, you're really, you're still alive, but you're actually pretty much in heaven. Um, and I was certainly struck when the, this committee um, undertook an inquiry into the assisted suicide bill that, palliative care was described in such glowing terms and that whole near-death pro you know, process that I made the comment, I think that I can hardly wait for that to happen to me. And, 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 and therefore, I just wondered that how much of this is about um, the real pressures in terms of interventions that we can make, better technology, better treatment, and so on, and how much of it um, is public perceptions which are perhaps unrealistic but contribute to making a pro making you know intensifying the problem rather than um, helping with the problem Dr. Patterson. <laughs> I think public perception societal perception public has a huge role in all this um, and I think that in, in turn is often pushed by media who, who can have a very um, worrying influence sometimes and just what people think, just you think of Thoreau around the LCP to see the, the damage that I would contest that the media can do. Um, healthcare professionals, and I would say particularly doctors, I mean, I really, I can only speak for my own profession here. I think we are very guilty of, of promulgating that myth as well, that we can fix everything um, forever. Um, and it's a dangerous one. And it's a game that we've been playing in healthcare now for probably 60, 70 years, pretty successfully. Um, but we've probably reached the kind of limit of what we can do in a lot of stuff like that. Um, with regard to the, the, the palliative care side of things, if, if people do require specialist palliative care, then it, it is my, my experience of my patients who've, who've had specialist palliative care input, say, in the, one of the local hospitals, say, is that it is truly tremendously good. <coughs> I mean, it is. It's fantastic. Um, and some of that is because of the skill level, some of that is because of the surroundings, and some of that is because of things like the staff numbers. Um, and my, my heart goes out, and, and Ranald was talking before, to, to the care home staff who are supplying lots and lots and lots of palliative care. Um, they don't even know they're doing it, and they're doing it often extremely well and unrecognised mm -hmm. with skeleton staff. And you might have one trained member of staff on at night for 24 residents, and somebody's dying. Now, that's really good quality palliative care, and they're not given credence for that. Um, so I think it's just, it's kind of... Seeing that shift of focus away from the, 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 the heaven's anteroom 
uh, and saying, right, actually, no, we need to think about this in the reality for far more people. And, and specialist palliative care, though it is very, 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 very good, is still probably, I would think, more focused on cancer than perhaps the numbers would suggest. Um, I mean, the numbers, I guess, would still be roughly about a third cancer, roughly a third long-term conditions, and a third frailty old age dementia. And I suspect that and it must be seven, eight years since we looked at it in GGC, where I, I work as a GP, but seven, eight years ago, um, the, the percentage of people dying from non-cancer illnesses, say, in hospices, was very, very small indeed. So it is about broadening it out, and I think St. Christopher's stuff like that are at the forefront of that, I would say. Anyone else like to respond to Mike? I, I oh, guess. Professor? If, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, I, there are two things. I think society and actually an awful lot of doctors think that patients only die when doctors stop treating them because otherwise they wouldn't be abusing people with monstrous interventions that are quite clearly going to make no difference and yet they feel better at having done it. And, and there is what I would call the dance of denial going on. So there are certain social contracts we have um, and I think there's a difficulty there, and that's a cultural question that we have to look at very specifically. And, and the early engagement of palliative care, which I mentioned with the lung cancer stuff, surprise, surprise, people live longer. Why? Because we actually promote their living rather than preoccupy ourselves with their dying and giving them treatments, which actually probably are more harmful than beneficial. So the harm-benefit analysis, the, the finely balanced uh, equation between whether an intervention is going to do anything or not, depends on a much more sophisticated answer as to what's a benefit and what's a harm. And that changes as people start to die. <clears throat> to answer the specialist palliative care question, um, being human entails suffering. I think that's just a fact. And for us to pr pretend otherwise is ridiculous. But suffering is also a perception. Insofar as I know many people who are incredibly disabled, uh, who live very fulfilled lives and and the debates that we've had both sides of the border recently about assisted suicide um, has turned often on on this question of perception and, and suffering and what people see to be that um, and often as not we are managing the least worst um, but to to free people from the proposition that there's a magical thing called a good death um, I think is helpful I think to look at a healthy death, which is one that makes sense to that person in their context, is important. That it has to have cultural um, appropriateness. But also, some people do actually need to struggle as they die, peculiarly, particularly young people with young families. And, and, and it, 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 the more you work with the suffering of people, and, and you will probably know this more than I do in a sense, Sandra, as a nurse, and if you go into a care home, the, the incredibly complex dialogue and interaction that's going on is a social phenomenon. People die from a life, not just from a disease. And, and it's engaging the reality of that, I think, that helps people to bring meaning. And it's getting to the place of bringing the meaning into the situation, rather than talking about spirituality or religion, but meaning, that makes the difference for folk. And I think that that's perhaps where we've got a, a slight advantage in the specialty, in that we've got the time, the resource, the motivation and the training to engage with what are sometimes very painful things. And, and a least worse can turn out to be very much a best, often as not getting through the gate of a really bad time is anybody's read uh, uh, The Death of Ivan Illich by Leo Tolstoy, that's a well worth an afternoon's read. It takes you into an understanding of the nature of suffering in a particular kind of way. Thank you very much. I'll make a point of reading that. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll move to our next question. I think it's Bob Doris. Thanks, Convener. Um, apologies to be driven by process a little bit, because the whole thing is about, I know it's about how we care for people, but earlier on at the start of this evidence session, emergency care summary was mentioned, electronic palliative care summary was mentioned, palliative care register was mentioned, key information system was mentioned, and speak care action plans were mentioned, and overarching, Sandra, I think you were talking about communications and how these all interact with each other. That, I'm trying to think of it in terms of how that then impacts on how resources are allocated to help 
with people's care because we know it comes down a lot of it comes down to resources and time and, and we know this and I'm just wondering the palliative care register when you no one wants to find themselves on it but you know you, you, it, whether your condition is your condition you may or may not be on the palliative care register so I suppose the issue is about whether that then directs more time or resource towards you when you go on it so I'm interested to, to know about about that of course um, but also other ways that you might go on the palliative care register so for example if someone's in hospital for whatever reason the elderly whoever and they're to be discharged their discharge plan put in place would someone as part of that discharge plan going is this person nearing the end of their life for whatever reason uh, is, is it effectively is their palliative care taking place even if it's called that or not called that and does that feed into a back channel should this person be on a palliative care register or like, likewise in care homes when you're doing anticipatory care planning or care reviews in care homes how does that feed in because we know the GP is the hub of it all but Dr Parson they can't, we know they can't do everything you don't have the time to do everything so uh, uh, does it drive resources if you find yourself on that register or not uh, and I suppose what are the other ways by which we, we work out whether people who have have, have missed, missed out, maybe the wrong expression, who perhaps should be on it but aren't, that's an opportunity to place them on it, I suppose. Sorry, it's process-driven, but I'm just trying to get my head around in public policy terms if we change structures, how, how we do this. Uh, many things there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we get some very, very good discharge from hospital where people will be discharged home um, with the expectation that they are now facing death in some sort of immediacy that matters to everyone. That might be days, it might be hours, days, weeks, months, longer. So there is that sort of thing, and that's extremely helpful. Um, nothing makes my life easier as a generalist, which is what I am, as if one of my more knowledgeable specialist colleagues in whatever discipline says, that's that, then I can do my stuff. That's OK. Um, it doesn't make a difference to what people get. Uh, I suppose, yes. I mean, I'm unlikely to refer somebody for specialist palliative care input if I don't think that they are dying. So from that point of view. But should it make much difference? If, if people can sort of buy the model I'm suggesting, which this is just good care for people who happen to be dying, I'm not sure that it does matter quite so much. Uh, where do resources need to go? I think that was part of that. Um, I would say, in my mind, one of the things that I've kind of got for me is a... a it's, it's, a, it's lifted out of Maslow's Pyramid of Human Need, and I would start, start down at the bottom. There's a few core things that people need. Uh, I'm, I'm being dead serious with this. I mean, they need things like they need a bed, they need aids and appliances, stuff like that. But one up above that, they need care. They need people who are there about them, whether it's their family if possible, if they've got family or social carers, before you even get involved with health and nursing. Now, we're not in a situation, certainly where I work, where I can guarantee care for somebody who's dying. Um, my last man who died of MND, and again, I have his permission. We could not guarantee the single man whose nearest relations were two brothers, one in Skye and one in York, we could not guarantee him a night carer every night of the week. Now, this is somebody who is so paralyzed that they cannot move. Now, until we get that right, I'm struggling with the, kind of the rest of the stuff, because that's pretty core. So I, I would say, yes, there's a lot of stuff there. It's back to what Randall was saying. The people who are supplying that sort of job and Cordia who are doing the care for that man were fantastic. And we need to celebrate what they do, but we need a lot more of them, and that's a macroeconomic issue, I would contest. Because they, they, they should, I believe, they should be paid a lot more. These are people who are working with the most vulnerable and needy people, I would say, that we've got. And we're paying them less than if they were stacking shelves in Tesco's. Now, that doesn't work for me. And on top of paying them a decent wage and giving them a decent career structure, we also should, I think, be looking at their personal attributes, and I know that's a dodgy area to go into, but people who are genuinely caring, who are compassionate, who are empathetic, and there are big differences in people. And there's some research from palliative care looking at actually at personality mm -hmm. between palliative care and some other people, and they're very different. I think I am quite a caring, compassionate individual. I would be a disastrous surgeon. I'd be full of anxiety and worry, and should I cut that artery and stuff like this? It would be, it would be terrible. So let's look for the right people and let's give them a career and let's give them a wage. <coughs> Sorry, it's a, I, I was behind Randall and I just so behind you. You were, you were cheering. I, I, you were noted. 
<laughs> Professor George wants to respond. There, there, anyone else there are some da data available on case complexity, but I'm always very cautious about looking at any kind of calculus of how complicated cases are because of all the things that I spoke to you about just earlier on, that, that, that it's the humanness that's often complicated. But if you can't provide a bed or somebody to care for somebody, then that's pretty, pretty bad and it's across our, our nations that is a problem. But there are ways of measuring case complexity. There are ways of looking at the resource that goes with that. But that tends to be once you get into the higher areas of of specialist practice rather than down at the basics and actually if you get the basics right I think an awful lot more in a utilitarian sense would be achieved. Mm -hmm. Anyone else Sandra? <coughs> I've got you Dennis. Sorry. I think it's important to say that not everyone who is dying requires specialist mm -hmm. palliative care. I think that's very important to say that. Yes, the, the surroundings and the, the environment in which you know, hospices function are fantastic, but not everyone, not everyone who is dying needs that type of care. And it's important to differentiate between who does need so that those who really do need that have access to it when they, when they need it, regardless of diagnosis. And I think that's the, that's the important thing. Um, and another point to make is there's been a lot of talk in, pr in the previous session particularly about older people, but there is a bit of inequity around the under 65 year old too. Although there are less people dying younger, which is fantastic, actually sometimes that can pose challenges for teams when planning care packages, etc. And, um, and I think we have to be mindful of that, uh, that we need to be you know, careful around the, the sort of funding for um, people who are perhaps younger and they are already perhaps facing difficult financial challenges. As I talked about, that there's living along with the dying. Families still have to work, children still have to be picked up from school, granny still has to be taken care of while someone else might be dying. So there's the whole social complexity that we need to be able to support families and not just the person who is actually dying with. And the carers around that as well. So. Bob? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, again, sorry it was kind of process driven, but, 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 what was, but unfortunately sometimes that that's the avenue we're, we're, we're kind of forced into when we, when we look at structures. Um, I was trying to tease out whether or not there was a way of prioritising via the palliative care register, whether that happened or not in terms of, of, of money. But I, I, we, we know it's about care and then degrees of care and the resources you have for that and, and, and we hope. But also it's probably worth noting that, and, and I'll just note it, convener, that um, I've got a number of constituents who work for Cordia who have came with very direct experiences of a pretty tough time they're having right now. I wouldn't elaborate on that because that had been appropriate to this committee, but I think they think it was odd if I didn't mention that um, at, at this committee. I want to come back to prioritisation of, of care needs again. And I would, Ronald Mayor is always very passionate about, um, about, about his stuff, but you know, if you've got a number of people in a care home and you have your staffing ratio, if you have... 10 older people in a, in a unit and three of them find themselves on that palliative care register, that could trigger a higher staffing complement. I'm not saying it should, but I'm just trying to think out how we direct the prioritisation of resources because it's very, I know it should all be individualised, but I'm trying to think how we put systems in place to direct resources in the most appropriate way. Likewise, if you have a care worker for Cordia who has a dozen clients and uh, none of them have palliative care needs, and another one who have three or four with palliative care, palliative care needs, should their caseload be smaller and have more time for visits. So it's about how we use the information we have to better prioritise the resources that exist. And I get that whole thing about, yes, more resources would be nice and better systems would be nice, but it's that system of prioritisation that I'm trying to get to. Professor Bro, that's uh, George. That's precisely where the case complexity type of modelling is useful, um, uh, certainly within caseloads or within, within service provision, I think would be fair to say. And, and certainly in, 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 I think, good clinical practice, and we, we have four community teams that cover a population of about one and a half million or something like that, um, and, and uh, we pay attention to the caseloading across the nurses who are working precisely to do that and to equilibrate out and also dis to distribute the burden of practice. And with that, if you have a funding structure which is 
then reflecting the complexity of practice, then you will see that consequent on that, you will get a better and a justifiable argument for how you are or are not using or claiming resource. So there are process measures available. There are some that are validated and are being developed, and I can give you information on that if it will help. Uh, but they are, I have to say, to do with specialist practice as distinct from okay. um, other things, but they, they would give you some markers. I'm trying, think, I'm, I'm trying to think of several kind of the clinical examples that I work with. And, I mean, we supply care, we supply medical care to a social care-run um, centre in the community where they have several people with young people with very severe needs, learning, disability, and so on. Um, and they're not, they're not palliative, these people, but they've got huge needs. Uh, and I would hate to think that their needs were not met because we're looking after dying people. In the care home that we supply care to, we've got about 25 people now in one care home. And I think probably the couple of people who need most time are actually not the dying ones. I mean, they're people with really severe, like really advanced dementia, who, whose, whose, whose behaviours are now, in the, the, the term we have to use is challenging behaviours. And they're really challenging behaviours. And if you've got low staff levels, that's very difficult. But they're not actually... Would I be surprised if they were to die this year? Well, I wouldn't be that surprised. We were surprised. They didn't know it would be that surprised. They, I, I, I would struggle to put them in my register, but they still need a high level of care. Um, so it, it, it would be some model you'd need which mm. not, didn't just look at is the person now on, the, on their final dying trajectory, whatever that means, or whatever time scales. Um, and I don't think that's to do with palliative care registers. Um, <coughs> we could probably discuss. I mean, I mean, the four of us even who are interested in this, we could discuss part of care and who should go on it for three or four days and not oh, come yeah. to a conclusion yeah, sure. easily. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if it's from diagnosis, does that mean every 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 person who's diagnosed with dementia, they go on your part of care register because that's a life limiting illness. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. 14 years statistically you've got. Maybe, maybe not. Pancreatic cancer, now that's a bad one. Now, my experience of that is that's one of the worst conditions to get. It is a death sentence, usually within a year in my clinical practice. So, yes, I would put me in my part of care register. I wouldn't if I was demented. And in between that, and these are the gross examples, in between that you've got all the different complexity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of people who, and, and I'm, I'm not being flippant, but our patients refuse to do what's expected of them. <laughs> they get better when you think they'll get worse, and they get worse when you think they'll get better. And then you replan, you replan, you replan. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I don't think it, I, I love the idea of the process, but it's too complex for that process, I think. Mm -hmm. Sandra? That's Sorry, that's where, that's where tools like the SPICT tool is... is is helpful mm -hmm. in 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 uh, trying to identify those who may um, be expected to die within the next year, but I accept it's very. Someone mentioned earlier on there's the predictability of some illnesses, but a lot of it is unpredictable, yeah. and a lot has been talked about the uncertainty, and it's not just the uncertainty of the illness; it's the families who live with that uncertainty, and how do we support them to live with that uncertainty, and the vast majority of care that happens is, is, is good care, and people want to deliver really good, good care. It's how we support them to be able to do that. So. Did you want to come back in there? Though? So we, 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 we tried the other year, we ran SPICT, the Scottish Pneumonia Indicator Guidance Tool, across our practice population. We've only got 4,000 patients. We, we kind of identified 140 odd people. Now, we can't consider 140 people from the point of view of dying. We do not have enough time to do that. There's, there's an awful lot of people who are not dying that we're supplying care to as well. Uh, so it, it, the numbers, SPECT is useful as a starter for 10, but it doesn't really help you to get right down into the, the group that you need to worry about, the, new, the group you need to be concerned about, the group that you need to visit their ceilings of treatment intervention and do more of the, the existential witnessing role because it's coming to an end and people need, well, it's much better if they're prepared and if their family and loved ones are prepared. Um, the other thing I would want to say, I'm not, I'm not sure, maybe you've covered this before, it's just I, I haven't heard the hospital setting mentioned, and if you've already de dealt with that, I will be quiet now, but I do feel for my colleagues in the acute setting, um, it is far, far more uncertain than it is where I work, because in the hospital setting they can do far, far more dramatic stuff to people, and so their decision making is very, very different from mine. I mean, the watershed for me as a GP is do you go into hospital or not? If you don't go into hospital, it's not a lot going to happen from the point of view of 
life-saving, dramatic interventions, because there's not much we do in the community like that, or where I work in inner city Glasgow, may be different in a more rural area where GPs are more involved in that. But in the acute setting, the, the ability to, to maintain somebody, to help someone improve, to, to not quite resurrect them, but get them back out into a reasonable quality of life for another few months is very, very difficult. And I think that's maybe sometimes why people seem to go along this and be passed from pillar to post, because they're still trying hard to get the person with COPD who's in with her eighth exacerbation in two years to make a recovery and get home again for another mm -hmm. three or four months. Mm -hmm. But suddenly they're not for non-invasive ventilation, and suddenly they are now dying. And that decision is made, and it's a sudden sea change for people. That's a hard place to work, and I just to be mindful of, of, of that environment. Yeah. Is anyone else, you've got a comment on the acute setting? I mean, you referred to some of it earlier, Professor, didn't you, in terms of yes, I, invasive I'm, treatments and people's choice at that, you know? It, it's incredibly difficult. Um, <clears throat> I could regale you with, with hundreds of stories because I, I work in the acute sector as well. I work in a tertiary hospital from time to time. And, and the whole problem of managing between acute sector and community is important. Rapid discharge planning. Um, if somebody has got what you might call an acute attack of death or acute on chronic dying um, and they want to be home, can you mobilise them and get them out of hospital in six to 12 hours um, facing the possibility of those things? I mean, we've got as many definitions of dying as, as Eskimos have of snow. Uh, it, I mean, that really is, you know, without being flippant, that is true because there are so many variables. And, and one of the immensely difficult tasks in the acute sector is that the acute sector is built to deal with diagnostic specific problems so they are, I mean I've been quoted in the newspapers of saying they're like conveyor belts and processing plants and that's not necessarily a bad thing because hospitals do that most effectively but there are some people who do need to die in hospital and the COPD person the person with um, heart failure um, very ba bad symptomatology they are people often who do need to, to die in a hospital setting because of the levels of uncertainty that lead up to a death and you don't know they're going to die until 24 hours mm -hmm. or 48 hours before they die. And furthermore, you only realise that after they've died. So it's that difficult in terms of prognostication. One in ten patients um, that we would say are in the last week of life turn out not to be, even amongst the experts. So this is where the issues around the LCP and so on were so t difficult for us to manage in the acute setting. So that's a very, very different environment. And, and, and we have to recognise those difficulties. And we need, in my opinion, to have mechanisms and possibilities where individuals can be cared for in those settings. And there are good examples of, of hospitals that have palliative care units that are either acute intervention, rapid turnaround units for difficult symptoms, or have units um, where people can be looked after as they die over a few hours or a couple of days. So there needs to be more flexibility in that because necessarily people do die in hospital often because they need to and we have to see that, commu that group of people and not turn them into potentially deprived recipients of care because we're preoccupied with, with community and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Ewan, thank you. Sandra, Maggie, do you wish to... Yeah, Maggie. I think that's, that's where the different levels of education and training come in as well, in that people working in acute settings may or may not be working with death and dying most of the time, or just some of the time. But there is something about the different levels of education and training and getting some of that, at least the very basic level of education to everybody in an acute setting if they're actually likely to be involved with people who are at the end of life are requiring palliative care. The RC ended a survey last September, October, September um, 2014, and within a few, it was about end of life care, and they asked their members key questions around how they provided end of life care. Almost 8,000 nurses responded within a few days. It's the biggest response they've ever had, and what that tells us is that people are really passionate. The nurses are really passionate about what they do, and they're concerned about the knowledge that they maybe don't have. Over, I think almost 3,000 of those eight, almost 8,000 were hospital staff. And over a third had never, they dealt with dying on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but they had never had any formal education, and that troubled them. 
So I think it is important that we, we really have programmes that are out there and that staff are released to be able to attend these programmes. Um, be, or, or encourage reflective practice. I think there's other ways that we can we can educate and teach people and learning on the on the ward or in the in the environment that we work in, and reflective practice is one of those models that we can begin to, you know, um, um, enhance the, the, the knowledge that's there. <coughs> Time's going on now. I've got one final question. I've got agreement from the committee that that's the case. Or does anyone want in? Quite a bit. Right, D Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Dennis. I'll try and be brief, convener. Uh, Professor Clark um, believes that one of the ways of, of trying to ensure that we provide good quality care for the future is to look back, and that is at the National Bereavement Survey, and use that as a tool for measuring the outcomes. And in fact, I, I, I found it a strange uh, uh, terminology in terms of a satisfaction <laughs> survey. Um, but it's looking at care, the provision of care, what was there, what could have been there, but it's only it's only um, it's it's uh, it's there for the carers and relatives, and what we've heard at the moment is maybe perhaps we should be looking at the professionals and what they believe as well. Do you think that a national bereavement survey is the way to collect the information, such as what we have in England, the the Voices survey? Just your view on that. The national bereavement survey is one way of looking at people's needs and what individuals want. Professionals will also have a perspective on what people need, which may or may not be what the individual want, but I think the bit that professionals also bring to it are some of the things that families and relatives may not recognise. So professionals may be able to pick up on different aspects. So there may be two, two sides to that. Yes, the bereavement survey is a good way of looking at how, thing, how people would have liked things to be, but also there's the professional side of it and what professionals feel could have been done better too. Uh, this is a particular soapbox, actually, so forgive me. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's very, very valuable data. But let's not forget, it is a group of people who themselves have had the burden of witness and to what extent they are dealing with their own um, loss and suffering uh, uh, is, is worth taking note. But th that's not what I wanted to say, really. The, there are two groups of people that sp we care for as specialists. Um, those are the people who are dying in their families, but they're also our colleagues. So I spend as much time supporting my colleagues in their decision-making, helping them through with, with difficult problems and, and debriefing them and so on and so forth. And I think that we probably need to develop measurement tools, and they are experience measures, um, to find out whether we're actually delivering adequately for our colleagues. So that, I think that's a task for specialists to do. And in that regard, just going back to the hospital question, um, I think that everybody should have access f um, as professionals to advice from specialists around the clock. That can be in any form of, of way, um, but particularly in hospital settings where often death does arrive in a very unexpected and often a very unpleasant way. And it's the legacy of bad death from these kinds of things that lead to such difficulties in society. I would say expert witness on the LCP um, inquiry with Lady Neuberger. And the experiences that families related were dreadful. And actually a lot of it, if there had been support for staff and the opportunity to help staff um, by peers or by um, experts, doesn't matter, uh, I think that the experiences would have been a lot better for all concerned. And the morbidity amongst clinicians who have been involved in bad deaths is, is, a, is a, a, an iceberg of problems that we just do not know about and is something that I think as a society we are going to need to face at some point. Yeah, um, I think I mean, one of the things that general practice has been doing for a long time now is significant event analysis. Yeah. So where something happens that is significant and you look at it and that can be death and it can be other things as well. Um, <coughs> That's part of the GP contract as well, is to encourage that. And I think it's a very good way to learn. So looking at a death that went well and looking at a death that went badly, I think is hugely instructive. We also do the same sort of thing with care homes, and you can do post-death analysis. And you can do that at a fairly simple level or a deeper level. Um, and again, encouraging people to review what happened. It is very much kind of centred in the healthcare professionals. I, I accept that, but in conjunction with things like the Voices programme, 
and other bits of work, I think that could work very well. The caveat, of course, is that that takes a lot of time. If, if, I, if, if, if I look at one of the deaths and of my patients and then we discuss that as a practice, I reckon that, and the unit of currency I use is appointments, because that's their unit of currency now. That's about 80-odd appointments we lose if we do that. Now, we are trying to offer the metric that's used now is the number of appointments you offer per 1,000 patients per week in general practice land. And we are trying to offer now about 90 to 100 appointments a week to try and meet demand. So 90 to 100 appointments per 1,000 patients a week. So we're looking at offering 400 appointments. So 80-odd appointments is a fifth of our weekly total for one review. If the five of us were all part-time, if we all do that, then that's a whole week gone, just on death. Not on misdiagnosis of cancer, say, or the, the NEI with the child, which is terribly important, or the postnatal depression, which could be catastrophic if we missed that. So the worry is that we, we are struggling to meet demand as it is, and we've got these tools, but we need more of us to do this properly. And it's not that they're bad tools, it's just that the, the system that we're working just now is creaking. Anyone else? Professor George, just to put this on the record before we were finishing up now, but you mentioned a couple of times the important role that you have in supporting mm -hmm. professional colleagues in dealing with uh, bad deaths and, and others and the treatments. And uh, just relating to some of the stuff was run on earlier, in terms of home carers, if you put it in the hierarchy, you maybe see a doctor once a week, once a fortnight, a nurse twice a week. Home carers are in to these homes on a daily basis, mm -hmm. building up attachments and whatever. The perception, I'm putting it to you, I don't know if you, maybe uh, Sandra or Maggie can tell me if any of this goes on, but when that death occurs, eventually occurs, they, they, they will often be at the funeral and they'll be around the family. Is there any, is there any known support that's given to these predominantly women who provide that level of care? Does anybody know of any support mechanisms that they may have? Or maybe I should ask that question earlier. But uh, you know, it, in my experience, I don't know of any support mechanisms that help those that level of carers through, you know, a, a death of a young person or alongside somebody with MND or cancers or, or, or you know, or people who are at home. There doesn't seem to be much consideration about how we support them. I think probably from a health perspective, and Sandra, you might want to, to from a health perspective, it's probably more of an informal arrangement than any sort of mm -hmm. formal structure that's in place. For social care, I wouldn't be so sure because social care have a really good system of supervision for their, for their social care workers. Now, whether that extends down to home carers, I wouldn't really know. Yeah. Um, but it would be worth actually looking at that. But from a health perspective, it does tend to be very ad hoc and more but peer support. From a health perspective, uh, you know, as, as Professor George referred to, it's more of an informal it would be more process of an inf rather than yeah, there'll be something pocket, you there will be There will be pockets. And, yeah. pe you know, there will be there will be places that have put in some sort of system yeah. and there will be there will be good practice out there but for the most part I would think it's pretty much relies on peer support and, right, and so individual fair, teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but Sandra, did you wish to say? Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think there's any formal sort of um, yeah. systems but there'll be variable practice across the country, I would imagine. What I would say is that in the hospital setting, more and more I believe that spiritual care teams can pick up the support for staff, which is something that perhaps we wouldn't have seen maybe five, ten years ago. But certainly the spiritual care teams across the hospitals and the bereavement structure that's being set up in Scotland is about how we support staff as well as patients. So, okay. Professor George? Uh, I mean, there, there are some models of, of care. Um, and hospices do this, but again, they, it, it touches a small percentage of, of, of the population. And I think most of us as clinicians who work in the community, um, we would have as part of our caseload, um, we would have identified high-risk people or we would we'd take notice of the even the paid carers who are coming in and we will know who they are. And then, then there will be informal mechanisms that feed back into the care agency or actually providing debriefings. I'm just aware, for example, of the um, uh, uh, 
disability groups, for example, the homes that have um, uh, individuals with disabilities who are living much longer than they used to and are now dying in middle, uh, early to, to middle age, um, they often are, are encountering dying for the first time within a family, within a family setting, effectively. 10, 20 residents. So palliative care, certainly from our services, would be providing specific support around the, the bereavement of that whole social unit, effectively, which includes the carers and the other residents who will have known that individual maybe for 10 or 15 years and then have the burdens of their intellectual um, frailty and so on to deal with at the same time. So, but they're always informal. Thanks. Not, and not in any way to counter the importance of all these things, um, but one of the things that, just as a GP who's worked in the same area for almost 30 years, um, I, I'm constantly humbled by the phenomenal resilience of the people that I work with, my patients. What they've put up with through their lives, both in ill health and through some of the inequities in our society, is staggering. And their ability to cope is magnificent. And a lot of the carers that I will encounter uh, with, with the social carers, particularly of the patients of mine, they are from that area. Um, and they've been through it all. They've been there, done it, bought the T-shirt. And they are incredibly resilient. And I think, again, it's uh, to, to recognise that and to, to point it up to them. That, uh, because the danger is that we start to make them think that they're not coping. Whereas, actually, this is something else that they are well able to cope with. And maybe acknowledging the fact that they've been suffering is what they need. My last MND man who died, I mean, we had a couple of mutual teary encounters, the carers and me outside his house, because it was horrible. Um, and I think we all got a lot out of that. Um, and then we had a kind of bereavement meeting at his funeral. And that was good. Uh, and I think and my wee letter of congratulation to them and their staff, their manager, I think helped. But it is kind of informal and family-like, and it's, I think, and not, but not to decry their, these people's ability. Thanks for that. That concludes this evidence session. Um, thank you very, very much indeed for your attendance here, the evidence you have given, and of course, all the written evidence that we've received. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <coughs>